come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us for the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. The movie talk show podcast comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not. <laughs> In our quest for total world domination, and we do this every end of year, we go through the entire year's catalog of movies. There's so many. And tell you what we thought of them, because guess what? We actually do venture outside of this basement and see actual movies and theaters. Do you think, do you think uh, Igor? If you can believe it. <laughs> we should, uh, one of these years, we should, uh, we should uh, we'd have to do some writing for it. We should figure out Igor's top five of the year. I might take a little brainstorming a little writing to do but I mean we just need to talk to Igor I mean ever it. since ever since I saw a Nicholas Winding reference top 10 best movies of all time I've, I I feel inspired to do Igor's top 5 now <laughs> right yeah it's the populist top five. It, that's pretty right. good. It's, it's, it's Frankenstein every year. Yeah. I was going to say, you know his favorite this year's four things. Like, <laughs> obviously. Yes, definitely. Obviously. Well, we should probably let the good folks at home know who these disembodied voices are. These are the internet radio superstars. Howie. Sean. Michaela. And I'm Colin. And tonight we're coming from you remotely in flashbacks of the year 2020 or 2021. Because yes, the Rona, the Rona is among <laughs> oh, us. Oh yeah, it's a, it is among us. It has struck the freak show down, unfortunately. Mm. Again, 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 again. <laughs> Don't worry, all. I will ride to the front of the battle lines and fight it off. <laughs> Sean is Sean is living his own I am legend type story. Yeah, right, right, yeah. where he's at. Yeah. Sean is immune. Yeah, Sean with the, the last, natural immunity. The last yeah. man of Corona. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good story. <laughs> um well um so i mean the year 2023 was marked by highs and lows and uh yeah. there's a lot of stuff that came out too um much. too much is that how we're describing this year I mean, yeah, it's, I don't. it's probably just me I, it don't no, it's too too much. no no it's not too much no, it's just a yeah. year of mid it's just a year of average mid shit that's what yes it's. thank you obviously like I, I don't know about you guys but i've been cramming for like the last couple weeks and yes, i'm just same. like overwhelmed by by mediocrity like it's just non-stop like blah a lot of three-star movies this year that i don't know yeah. really strongly about yeah I mean, really- you're, you're right in that regard there are a lot of men i mean yeah I maybe when i was just looking through the because uh, I always end up looking through the films of 2023 because I can never remember what came out. Well, yeah, remember, yeah. Remember, we got a Scream movie this year that we've already talked about like twice. That we did an episode on. Right. <laughs> so it just feels like there's so much. But and if yeah, any of you sons of bitches make me talk about that again tonight, I'm going to be so mad. It is, I've, it is, I've avoided it. It is not on purpose. <laughs> well, we do. We do five uh, individually. We pick five of our. Well, we're going to call them the best, but they're actually our favorites. Our favorite. Okay, yeah. Great. I don't know if they're objectively the best movies, um, but the ones we enjoyed the most, and then we pick one worst. So we'll we'll scream six B, uh, one of the best or the worst movies of the year. This was also the year of the uh, like uh, comic book movie implosion. Is Marvel over? Marvel and DC and superheroes, are we done? DC is definitely over because they're selling their movies to Tubi. So, yes, yeah. DC is, is dead in the water. But I think Marvel, unfortunately, might still have a little steam left. Not much, got, not much, though. No, I think they have certain aspects of them are dead. I think the live actions, obviously, you know, uh, going down. But we'll talk about it. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, there okay. is. Okay. 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 Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. That shitty Ant-Man movie did come out this year. That's okay. true. <laughs> I forgot that that was this year. It's been a long so time. So was uh, Guardians 3 was this year, too. I forgot about that. Jeez. Oh, shit. Yeah. 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 That was a highlight, crazy? though. I kind of like that one. Is it on really? the list? Yeah. I didn't like that. Well, I didn't like it as much as the other two. It was kind of like... All right, I've already been here and done this, and it was kind of an Azran kind of like, yeah, yeah, but it I mean, wasn't it was really, horrible. No, but you could always you could tell like from the get go, it was like, oh, we're going through your heartstrings. Yeah, we're gonna try. Yeah, I don't need a raccoon backstory. That was a that was like an hour and a half of the the three hour movie was the Jesus. Rocket Raccoon story. Yeah, I, mean, I, like, I, I like Rocket, but I don't I don't need any of that. Yeah, I don't. There's just certain characters that I don't need their backstory. He's one of them. 
Uh, it's like we get it. He was a raccoon that was experimented on, and that's why he's like a superhero raccoon. We get it. Yeah. Right. Imagine if they tried to do a whole movie of like the Groot backstory. How much would you just like hate that? Shut your mouth right now because they will do it now that you said it. <laughs> I'm just like, no, don't do it. Don't put that, don't you dare put that on the universe. Get out there, Michaela. Deal with it. Vin Diesel is signing a contract right now. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll start with the. Uh, so we're gonna go. We're gonna go uh, up to like so five movies. Uh, one one a piece going up to our favorite movie of the year, and then we'll do the worst or one worst of the year, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, kicking off, I guess I'm going first on this one with uh, number number five, uh, wow. best movie of the year. I'm going to go with Creed 3. Ooh, all right. Almost made my list. Now. Okay. Yeah. Creed 3. That did, came out this did year. You, well, that, <laughs> see, that, was, that was the first movie that I saw this year where I sat there and I'm like, I really like this movie. I loved the original Creed. Um, Creed is great. Yeah. Love that one. Yeah. Loved it. But I think part of why I loved the original Creed was because it was basically. Uh, another Rocky movie. It was like yes. a, you know, it was another Rocky movie, except he had become the Mickey. Yes. Right. And was able yep. to, you know, so he's teaching Adonis Creed, you know. And there's some great emotional moments in that movie. Yeah. No, that was, they should have killed Rocky at the end of that movie, they, I yeah. think. Makes, you know. Yeah. It's just like, ah, he's not going to win this one. Though. Yeah. Now, did you guys see Creed 2? Yes. Not so good. That wasn't so good. And that was where, you know, we had Ivan Drago, right, from Rocky Four, and his son had to take on, you know, the old rivalry between Rocky and, and Ivan Drago. Creep 2 felt like, you know how when uh, Stallone fucks up, he goes back to his... His, his bona fides, the things that made him. Every time. Yeah. We've talked Creed, about this. Right. Creed 2 feels like like that. Like, Creed 2 is one of those where he's just like, ah, I gotta go back to this. And they didn't do it too well. Yeah, well, he wrote that one, I want to say, because the first one was, uh, yes. I don't know if he wrote the first one. I think that was Ryan Coogler, right? Because that was before yeah. Ryan Coogler got Black Panther. Um, Fruitvale Station and everything. Yeah. yeah. And Creed 2, Creed 2 was written by Stallone, and uh, Creed Three is written by two guys. I think it was uh, Ryan Coogler's brother. Yes. And this other guy, like Zach Bevins or something, who I had also so, yeah. written, um, he wrote uh, King Richard, I think, right? And I think he also wrote this year's Gran Turismo yes, uh, movie. So, so and directed by. And directed by Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan. Yeah. Um, no. I think what impressed me about it, because it doesn't have Stallone in it at all. So Rocky he's not in this one at all and it brings in this other character it's played by jonathan majors who's you know uh i mean say what you will about him and i know now he's never going to probably work again right but that guy was a compelling screen presence yes and he's really good he's been really good in everything that i've seen him in yep. even his king the conqueror i thought he was doing stuff that i'm like this is he's playing against like how this is actually written i yep. i actually really liked him in uh my one of my favorite movies from last year the year before the harder they fall i thought he was great in that oh, yes. oh right yeah, yeah, he's, he was, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's a good intense actor who like gets yeah too bad it. he shed all over that yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> like, right that intensity that he applies to all this stuff has boiled over into his private life which has now become his public life and so the downfall but he is a good actor yeah and he's um he's uh adonis is like childhood friend who took the rap or the fall for a crime that i think they had committed as children and he gets out of jail and he's like he's the one who was actually like interested in boxing you know and so he's like you know i did this for you back then you deserve you know you should give me a shot and they're they kind of have a rivalry that develops over the movie because i think there is like a genuine friendship there but ego right eventually yep. kind of shatters that ego and what you think you deserve and what you got screwed out of and yeah yeah um i was uh i was really drawn into it and i think you know some of it may be i uh, really enjoy aspirational heroes in movies and to me creed's adonis's creed story is a lot like rocky you know i mean it's very different so it's not like you're watching the same movie again right right uh 
and it was compelling. And I don't know, I just, I really, um, you know, wanted him to win, you know, and it really does kind of feel like the odds are stacked against him, even though he's the title holder in that movie. But, um, and I thought Michael B. Jordan, like I always, you got to give some, additional credit to these guys who are able to um direct and be in front of the camera because that's got to be extremely difficult to direct your co-stars you know while you're in there also trying to emotionally get into a you know a frame of mind so i thought you know i think it's his first directorial thing and you know obviously surrounded by a team of uh helpful ad's and and all that but i still thought that it was very impressive and uh yeah it was it was a um arousing arousing uh movie you know by the end of it. yeah how do you how do you do that because you gotta stand across from someone who's acting at you and you have to be the character that they're talking to but you also gotta watch them to make sure that you're getting what you need from them for the scene. Yeah, incredibly, it's gotta be incredible. I'm assuming difficult. that he was inspired by working with Stallone. I mean, Stallone had done that, you know, so many times in his career, right. and you know, um, it's just to to be working with someone with that kind of legacy in Hollywood, you know, kind of, I'm sure, inspired him, you know, to want to do it himself. And yeah, I thought I thought Creed three was great. You guys haven't seen it, then? I saw it. No, I haven't seen it. Okay. Well, there you go. I'm (laughs) saying you should check out Creed 3, fifth best movie, or favorite movie of the year. (laughs) And now, Sean, what was your fifth best movie of the year? Okay. Number five is going to be the first of my two, what Michaela, Michaela would call my two dad picks that are on my list. Oh, can I guess what I think it is? No, because that's probably the next one. So you can save it. Okay, okay. (laughs) So you can save it because you're probably going to be right. Okay. Um, No, the first one is actually a stand-up comedy special. And it is um, from the comedian Mike Birbiglia. I don't know if you guys have ever watched any of Mike Birbiglia's stand-up routines or comedy over the years or seen him in any movies or anything. Um, I'm sorry, the state of movies is so bad in 2023 that a stand-up comedy special made it on your top five? Yes, because I was going through my list and I'm going, ah. Wow, 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 wow. This is shocking. I, I, yeah, I'm bored. <laughs> no, but I also missed a lot of movies this year that I just didn't get to. Like, looking at that 2023 list, I'm like, wow, I didn't watch a lot that I really wanted to. And I can mm. name, you know, we can name like 15 right now. But the reason I mention it is because... Mike Birbigli is one of the, he's a comedian that I've kind of, I've been watching for like many years now over his specials. And when they come out, they kind of hit at similar moments to where I am in my life. This is kind of the whole dad thing. Cause he's done uh, specials when he was younger. The one before this one was kind of about having, having kids um, and his whole thing with that um, during a time when I was like, my kid was young and raising him and coming into that era. This one is the, I mean, it's called the old man in the pool. Uh, it, it's about getting older and the things you have to deal with in life. And he, it's, he tells them in such a way, they're more one man shows than stand up comedy routines. So I, I know when you picture stand up comedy, you know, a guy standing up there with a mic telling, you know, jokes or one liners and stuff, but he's more of a storyteller uh, when it comes to what he does. And, you know, he talks about, yeah, you know, his health, uh, the stuff you do for your, your family. Uh, you know, you think of thinking about, um, your, your dad and kind of, uh, the things that, you know, you follow in their footsteps and everything, but he's very funny about it. Um, and also very sincere and, um, uh, maybe not heart wrenching, but you know, it's, it, it, it gets you in those areas, or at least it gets me. Um, and I think for some people in our audience, um, will would appreciate that and enjoy that type of comedy because we're not getting any younger here folks none of us look at all of you um but it's micro biglia the old man in the pool um it's extremely funny it's extremely heartfelt um uh and you know it made me feel all the warm and fuzzies warm and fuzzies this year and it made me laugh a lot so uh that is my number five i promise the rest are movies (laughs) All right, <laughs> promise. But for that fifth one, uh, I'm going with that one. So, Michael Biglia, uh, Holly. 
what is your number five movie of the mm. year? <laughs> my number five, um, actually, this the fact that this is on my top five surprised me. I was not expecting to like this movie as much as I did, and also it's kind of a controversial movie this year. Mm. But my number five is Maestro. Oh, I actually really enjoyed that movie. Yeah. I I know there's a lot of controversy between uh, among Bradley Cooper's performance and then also like his his nose. I I will (laughs) so yeah I will say the nose is distracting and I actually um I saw a I saw a review from Paul Schrader talked about how it's not even so much the nose it's the filter that is really distracting because it's like too puffy like so the makeup job is not even the prosthetic nose it's actually like the filtrum above, above the or below the nose above the lip um it, it looks like botox and it's very distracting um so i will agree that it's it, it's not great especially for the caliber of movie that it is it should be better right. um but i think we were talking earlier about how do you how do you direct and star in a movie like that? And Bradley Cooper like blows my mind with this movie. Um, his performance, I I thought it was really good. Um, I don't think the actual performance was a distraction. I know some people have said that it was, but I don't think so either. But the star in that movie is Carrie fucking Mulligan. She is absolutely incredible. I already love her. Um, and she is just sensational in this movie. She seems perfect for that more old time classic. Yes, she actress. does that like she does that like transatlantic accent perfectly. Right. Like she is such a good actress, and she is the star of this movie. She does such a good job. I hate um, how she always is a supporting character, though. Like, can we let her have a fucking movie? I know she's I know, a promising yeah. young woman, but like, she's always like the tortured wife of somebody. You know? She like, is, and I, I think it's. I think it's. You know, I mean, she does. She does it, but like, she's so great. So, like, yeah, write a movie for Carrie Mulligan. Absolutely, Promising Young Woman is one of my favorite movies. I love that movie so much. Um, but she is spectacular. She she brings so much feeling to this to this character. I mean, obviously, it's a very tumultuous relationship between Leonard Bernstein um, and Felicia, and and you know he he had multiple uh, male lovers throughout his life, but yet they were always married and they had children and they had this loving relationship, and it was just such an intense story of having a soulmate that isn't like your only love you know he had other people that he loved and it's just such an interesting story because you still you really do see the the love in their relationship despite the fact that like she knows he has male lovers and she just deals with it and she has this strength in her that is insane and it's it's just such an interesting story to me and it's it's a really beautiful story and also just i mean as a conductor as a composer he was remarkable and to watch bradley cooper like throw himself into that it was really convincing and really beautiful um so and it's a gorgeous movie stylistically like they go from black and white to color and it's just really cool the way it flows like it's one of those that they do it and you don't notice that it's transitioned from black and white to color and it's just a really gorgeous flow um yeah the cinematography is gorgeous uh, any movie that has like stage scenes with spotlights like the lighting is just going to be so cool in a movie like that and it's, it's just really beautiful so stylistically, it's gorgeous. The writing's gorgeous. Bradley Cooper, I'm continuously impressed by. Um, so, yeah, surprisingly, Maestro's my number five. How long? Did not see that coming. It's, uh, I mean, it's longer. It's uh, two-ish hours. What is, the, what is the story of Maestro? What's the... I mean, is it basically, is it just set in a short period of time or is it following, oh, no, is it I, like... No, it's, 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 um, yeah, it's Leonard Bernstein from, like, the day he gets the call to go to Carnegie Hall. Okay. So, like, from that moment where his, like, life as conductor, composer, Leonard Bernstein begins, when he gets the call to fill in at Carnegie, and then he meets Felicia, and they fall in love, and it's his life from that moment on. So when he becomes Leonard Bernstein, basically. So it's not like his early life, you know, in such childhood, it's not anything like that. It's that moment that, like, he reached fame from then on and the, and um, the love story I suppose. and the love story and then into okay. old age and because okay. and, she she suffered from cancer later in life so it's like their story of life and death together and it's 
yeah, so it's it's an intense story and it's really moving. Um, but yeah, I just I love those movies that really focus on interpersonal relationships with people that are interesting and it's more than just romance. Like they they were soulmates in a totally complicated way that I will never understand. <laughs> and yeah, it was just it was spectacular writing. So surprisingly did not see it coming maestro is my number five and this is a was that a netflix or an apple or a prime or who 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 put that out that was netflix wasn't it oh, theater, netflix. theaters and netflix yeah it was theater and netflix okay because i'd heard of it <laughs> but i mean the fact that it's out i didn't even hear about and i think you know yeah. every year it seems like i go on a screed so i'll save you from it about how streamers are basically killing the movie business by not you know it's they're not making their movies important i mean yeah. it's an important movie it's got bradley cooper directorial debut no he did uh no, a Star's he Boy. Did. so yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it would have been, you know, him as a director tackling, yeah. like, you know, one of uh, music's great artists of the 20th yeah. century. And <laughs> I, I, had, I, had read it, I had read an article before that Spielberg had been in the top to direct it instead of Bradley Cooper. But then Spielberg saw an early cut of A Star is Born. And immediately after he saw, like, the shallow scene, he went up to Bradley Cooper and he's like, you're doing Maestro. Okay. So it's just, I don't know, it's just... <laughs> I agree oh. with you. I wish that it had gotten it, w- it would have gotten more uh, more attention um, if oh, there was a theatrical Steven. release. But oh, Steven. oh Steven, I don't need to direct Maestro. Oh Steven, oh, Steven. yeah. Steven, thank you so much. <laughs> so yeah, I, I when you said you were picking a dad pick, I was like, is he going to pick Maestro or is that my dad pick? <laughs> I think that's your dad pick. Yeah, that's your version of a dad pick. I think. Although that would, that movie would make my dad uncomfortable, but that's beside the point. What? Is, oh, just because of like the gay liaisons and everything? Yeah, he's a boomer, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Understandable. <laughs> I remember when uh, we, we would do this show and like by the end of it, um, you would have like you, there'd be the same movies in different order on all of our lists. Right. Yeah. right. I'm going to guess that, that there, this is all going to be wildly different. Right. I yeah. think it is. I, I think over the years, like I don't know about you guys, but me specifically, like I I try to pick movies that I don't think you guys are going to pick because I like that we talk about different things. It makes for a better discussion. Yeah. Especially if we're, especially because, I mean, we go the whole year. Yeah. Like, I, I will never focus I, on specific things. It's nice to branch out yeah. at the end of the year. I will never forget with the 2017 when all of us were like, did you like The Witch? Yeah, I like The Witch. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> makes for a better conversation. Yeah. So anyway, that's my number five. It's Maestro. Michaela, what was your number five? Oh, man. Okay. I spent a lot of time pouring over my choices today because I, Holly, I too have been cramming for this. Like, it's a final I'm going to be graded on. So, uh, yeah, I put, I I put unnecessary you, pressure on myself for this. Um, man, uh, well, uh, I'm so torn. I'm going to have some honorable mentions, I think, because, man, I'm torn. But mm-hmm. I think my number five, I'm going to go with uh, Priscilla by Sofia Coppola. Um, so last year I had Elvis on my list by Boz Lerman, and that is the complete opposite of this movie. That is bombastic and loud and tacky, and go listen to me talk about it last year. Um, this one is is the complete opposite side of the same story, I would say. It's, it's quiet, it's understated, it's like delicate, but there's this like looming sadness over it that's kind of unsettling. And it's just the story of someone being gifted privilege but like through abuse and it doesn't really shy away from like the ugliness of uh elvis's life and did, it's did it's, you string those words together or did you read that somewhere because that was that was gorgeous no was i just did a, wrote a lot of notes today yeah, of what i was, to say because that was a gorgeous description <laughs> oh thank you I, I i like her movies are so beautiful i want to do them justice you know like Mm-hmm. Her movies, I just like want to crawl inside and live inside because she captures the atmosphere so well. Like there was a scene in this movie where you see Priscilla walking around Graceland barefoot, and like you hear the carpet under her feet, and it's like this custom made carpet with like Elvis's monogram all in it, and it's tacky and gold and yellow and it's wonderful. And like I just remember thinking, like I want to walk on that carpet. Like oh mm-hmm. my god, like it's just. But at the same time, like you do see the ugliness, and they do not shy away from the fact that she was fourteen and he was twenty four. It gets mentioned a lot in the movie like a lot a lot they don't shy away from that this is not glamorizing in any sense um I uh, 13 
One yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jesus. Um, and Holly and I saw this together and we're shocked to find out not the same day, but literally days later that Kaylee Spaney, the girl who played Priscilla, was in the craft legacy. Yeah, when you guys sent that, when you guys sent that in the in the group chat, I was like, you're fucking kidding me. And I, I well, it took us days to figure it out because things. it feels like a different person. Yeah, it does I totally feel like forgot. A different person. Yeah, and uh, she's great in this movie, though. I cannot mm-hmm. believe it's the same person because she is just fantastic in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I and my favorite thing about Sofia Coppola movies, Holly, you nailed this too, is that she knows exactly where to end the movie. Yeah. Um, that's and that's good. something that's something we bring up on the show a lot because we see a lot of movies where we're like, oh, they, if they would have just like ended this five minutes sooner, it would have been perfect, yeah. you know. And, and it's, I, it's funny because like I remember there was a time in my movie viewing experiences when I thought Sofia Coppola ended her movies abruptly, and then like yeah. as I've learned more about movies over time, I'm like, she nails it. She yeah. knows exactly where she's ending the story because there's more story that doesn't need to be told. Yeah, you know. this movie, I was really did not know how it was going to end. And yeah, I I couldn't stop because like this movie is just about uh, Priscilla Presley and how she met Elvis. It's based on Priscilla Presley's uh, memoir, and like the way it handles time and the way they grow apart and grow together is really interesting. And mm-hmm. the movie, I just couldn't stop thinking about because I'm pretty sure the last spoken line in the movie is Elvis says like, "What man am I losing you to?" And she says, "You're losing me to a life of my own." And then, like, that's the last line said in the movie. And, like, it it just ends perfectly. And I don't know. She has such an interesting way of doing biopics that I, mm-hmm. I don't know. I This movie made me, like, feel movie magic again. You know, I felt yeah. uh, transported to another time and place. And uh, I didn't expect, I didn't really know what to expect. I mean, I love Sofia Coppola, but, like, Elvis was so good. And I do think Austin Butler is the superior Elvis. But, I mean, the performances are asking so many different things. Uh, I mean, Jacob already got the juice, I guess. Uh, I mean, I hate that he I think he does have some talent he's not just pretty but he's yeah. not as good as Austin Butler I don't I think. was I was, I was irritated at how well he did as Elvis I know because I didn't want it to be I, I didn't want him to be as good as he was no but the, I know the it's like this is about, some dumb jock from Euphoria he shouldn't be good like but the interesting about interesting thing about Elvis is that it feels like he had so many eras to his life he did that, that you can yeah. get different actors in there to like really p- portray the key points of those of those eras and really bring them out so you can get different actors to do it which is but, kind of yeah nice. yeah but here's the problem Sean this movie covers the exact same time span as the Elvis movie oh. like uh. like like the Roman candle fight on the front lawn of Graceland is in both of these movies <laughs> that yeah. scene that scene made it to both that is that is, that ties yeah. the cinematic universe together the, right? yeah the uh, difference being the difference being Sofia Coppola ends her sooner because we don't get the later Elvis in that one sure. we get it yeah. with Austin Butler but not on this one yeah. well, I'll, I'll have to try and watch them again because like I think I mentioned before I got high and watched the first half hour of Elvis and my I was <laughs> uh, my mind was so blown I could not finish it because I'm just like I can't do this <laughs> I'm sober at this point I don't think I, it might <laughs> make my mind explode so I may have to go back and try these again. I imagine Tom Hanks is extra scary when you're high. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, Oh my God. I'm so mad that this movie did not have him come through even for a cameo. He could have been the fucking (laughs) Nick Fury of the Elvis Cinematic Universe tie together. Is that that character ever in Priscilla? No. He's he's talked about. He's He's mentioned on the like once, yeah, but you never see him. Yeah. Which is... Fine. Which, canonically, in my mind, it is Tom Hanks, then. Oh, absolutely. That's why I'm glad they never showed him, because in my mind, it can still be Tom Hanks. (laughs) Yeah. He's on the other end of that phone. Uh, (laughs) The the Elvis Cinematic Universe. (laughs) Okay, so, Holly, who's going to be the next one in the Elvis Cinematic Universe to get a movie, then? Oh, well, Lisa Marie, I think. Um, (laughs) How many Presleys do we have left? Uh, they're dropping like flies. Yeah, we have <laughs> Riley Keough is the the head honcho right now. Right, yeah, Riley Keough is the last yeah, one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, because she's yeah. Lisa. She's Lisa Marie's daughter. Yeah, yeah, but she's got she's got another kid, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah, there's another kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one who's a couple to stay out of the shadows. <laughs> oh, are there? Okay, I'm gonna have to look up the Elvis family tree after we get off here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so my number five is uh, Priscilla. Colin, what's your number four number for the year? Number four. 
Okay. So my number four is going to be the best original horror movie that I saw this year. And it's an A24 movie and it is called talk to me. Um, okay. This is also on my list. I think we, we all, we have to mention this, right? Okay. All right. All right. So this is also on my list. Okay. Well, this is also my number four on my list. Well. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there, I after I said I this, it I knew you all would. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so the premise is basically it takes the idea of a party game, kind of like... Yeah. It, it's, we're in a TikTok era, Colin. Yeah, like, so this, you, this tick, you, you stream... This is the new uh, uh, thing that's sweeping, sweeping Gen Z at this point. And it's also the new drug of choice for the younger generation. See, that's how I read it, basically. This is like, you know, at, at a party, somebody says, you know, hey, do this drug and whatever. So it's like a cautionary yes. tale and you know, how it can tear your life apart or whatever. But they come up with a decent gimmick, which is this mummified hand with like a curse written all over it and some kind of right that somebody's come across and uh, and they they sit around a couch and you grab the hand and say, talk to me. And uh, apparently there's like a 30 was it 30 second puff puff give rule where you can't is this 30 or like a 90 or something? maybe it was 90, 90 seconds 90 and seconds. then yeah, you have 90. to but what you're basically doing this is what the kids at gen z is up to today probably the kids because <laughs> uh, you got to warn them about this parents so they don't I, go out there and... I, I have talked to my son about, about, <laughs> about casual uh, possessions casual possessions yeah so <laughs> don't summon anything <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the idea right i it's like... actually said that to my son do not summon anything yeah if you don't know what you're doing. Right. No no lesser summonings, no major summonings, no no demons of any kind. Uh this is possessed people, I guess, that uh are drawn to this kind. Of, it reminded me a lot of uh the um it reminded me of Stir of Echoes was a movie that came to mind when I was watching this because that was also that was hypnotism. Only you're swapping out the hypnotism for uh, you know, the this possession. Yeah. And you're like, Well, how bad can that get? Well, the idea I think is that the main girl in the movie has recently lost her mother so of course she wants to overstay her welcome and then uh this escalates yeah in a she, series. Acc she accidentally runs into her mother in that side of the world right like if her mother comes through through someone else yeah yeah through the riley kid yeah because that yeah. was i think what i was on and that's why i don't want to uh, spoil it but the movie goes um it goes very dark. Um, there's a, a sense of foreboding, gloom, and doom that just kind of pervades the whole thing. And you just kind of watch. It's one of those movies where people are making bad decisions that become horrible decisions, uh, you know, accidents and just mistakes and just it's a snowball effect. And yep. And the movie, what I liked about it was it wasn't afraid to kind of pursue its own logic, uh, you know, right down into hell. I mean, it was yep. it was very grim, spooky. It was creepy. I remember, I don't know that it was necessary. I mean, it was probably like, you know, one of the scarier movies of the year. Um, and I would also, I think it's uh, directed by a uh, couple of, uh, I want to say they're Australians. It's a couple they are, pair of I have brothers. The names right here. Michael they, and Daniel. They are Denny uh, Philippow and Michael Philippow, uh, yeah. I will say. I think it's their yeah. first movie. I think they had graduated from like short films or music videos, probably short I think films, so. I think, into this. Uh, a promising start. It feels yeah. kind of like, you know, where Jennifer Kent was with like the Babadook or something, you know, yeah. or mm -hmm. Robert Eggers with The Witch. It's like this is a promising start for these guys. Um, there was a... A special shout out to Miranda Otto from uh, Lord of the Rings, right? She was Yowen, right? And Owen uh, Yowen yeah. in Lord of the Rings uh, plays, has finally graduated to being the mom in movies like this. So she's the name, uh, yeah. I guess, that they were able to get for their low budget horror movie. And she has some of the best, uh, like, suspicious mom, you know. Yeah, she's uh, great. She really, she really does, yes. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, tell me, you can tell me about the party because your brother already fessed up. You know, I mean, it's just like, 
like she was on the case of these kids knew what they were up to, you know, or at least thought she did. And, you know, who who knows that your kids are out there summoning, uh, you know, they're getting right. possessed she, and she, she is recording it on smart, TikTok and streaming. Right, she is smart as, uh, as one of those moms can be without knowing that it's a demon possession. Yeah, yeah like without the supernatural. It, but, right, but she's just like, she's not prepared for what it actually is. Yeah. Yeah, I really, um, I mean, I think I liked it, and I think I'm moving other movies uh, off of the list, which I guess we'll talk about maybe runners up later on, but um, because so often especially with playing with you know like ghost movies you got to get the blumhouse template and this is like this is a movie done outside of that you know and so yeah. it does feel very different thank um, god because i'm not a fan of ghost movies or, or even even kind of this is more demon possession and what have you but even when it veers into that tour even i'm like eh, i don't know and i really like yeah because they were they made the characters i think uh more more I mean, they're reckless teenagers or young adults, but it felt more realistic. Yeah, and it, and the relationships between the characters felt yeah. really nice. Yeah, because because I think there's a family, and the main character, um, I forgot her name, but has become part of that family since her mother had died, something like a year before. And she's sort of kind of quote unquote adopted because her father is also a character who's also dealing with the loss of his wife, and maybe doesn't have the capacity to help his daughter go through the same thing because he's also dealing with it. And so the extended family that she becomes a part of becomes um, an important thing to her. And that extended family sort of becomes the focus of bad things that are happening to them. Yeah. And so you really feel that through her as the main character. Yeah. Sophie Wilde was the actress. I don't yes. recall the character's name, but she was really good. I thought everybody she was, was really she good was for Mia. me. Mia, right, yeah. 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 But um I mean if you're if you're looking for a new uh you know, kinda new I don't know, a new wrinkle on an old idea. Right. Talk to me. I thought fit the bill is like that's probably what I thought was the best original horror movie um of the year. Uh Sean, what's your number four? My number four for the year. I will let Michaela announce because I'm pretty sure she has me dead to rights. Michaela, go for it. Air. Air. <laughs> Sean was the only person I knew in real life that was excited for this movie. Oh wait, it was that was a runner. I, that's one of my runner ups. Uh, I'm air. Very excited for this movie. You know what? Because you know what I did. I grew up. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago during. Possibly the greatest um, uh, uh, national sports run ever of watching Michael Jordan and the Bulls take six championships almost in a row. And it was one of the most exciting times of in, in sports history. I mean, mm -hmm. if you, especially if you've watched, like we've had since then, The Last Dance, the documentary has come out which is also like a fascinating watch because they got unprecedented access to the Bulls for that final year and the whole, whole history of them. So we get um, Plus the memes it gave us. Let's not forget the amazing memes we've gotten out of that documentary. I mean, and we, <laughs> right, and we, memes uh, consisting of some of like some of the actors that I really like watching. Right? We got Matt Damon, Jason Bateman, Ben Affleck. Say what you want about him. I like him as an actor. I think he's really good. I think he's a good director as well. He directed uh, it, right? He, uh, ben Affleck directed this movie. Um, it is it is the story of it is the story of Nike in the 19th because uh, I forgot the official years it's the 80s but yeah I, th I think it's the 80s yeah it's the early 80s because I think Michael Jordan came to the Bulls in 84 don't quote me on that um, but I think it was around 84 85 um, so it is the story of Nike who is not doing so well when we are introduced to them in the story and the executives and kind of the business of signing a big or up-and-coming NBA star, someone, you know, uh, hitching your wagon to what you hope is going to be a great star in the future for your shoes. And so Nike is trying to figure out, what do we do? Do we sign three stars, make shoes for them, try and go on for that? Meanwhile, like Reebok's kicking their ass and a bunch of other ones are doing well. 
And an executive gets the idea, hey, what if we don't spread this out? What if we focus on one dude? And what if that one dude is Michael Jordan? Before then, he was Michael Jordan. Before he was yeah. Michael Jordan. But the audience knows who Michael Jordan is. And so you're, you're, you're the kind of like the excitement is, you know what's going to happen, but the excitement is still built in because you're like, we know they get them, but what is the process of getting there? What, we know what Michael Jordan will become, but what took, what did it take to convince him to sign with Nike, who was uh, not the greatest choice at the time? Adidas, Reebok, a bunch of other ones. Nike was lowest on the totem pole to 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 do sort of this thing. And what would it take to get what you think will be one of the brightest stars to sign with your company to launch your product? And 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 it's it's a huge combination of you know a star and what you can do specifically for them. And it talks about the whole process of like. It goes through things like the design of the shoe, knowing that if they add like little things, like if they add color to his shoe, if they put red and black on his shoe, Michael Jordan's going to step on the court wearing the shoe, getting fined every single game for wearing the shoe. Because rules for the NBA at that point were like, you have to wear only white shoes at the time. And you seem like maybe details that many people wouldn't care about, but this movie kind of makes them exciting. It makes it exciting. Uh, it makes executives at a shoe uh, company exciting. Well, see, that was the thing. That's the irony of the movie, right? It's like, it's an underdog story with yeah. about executives at a shoe company. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's you an know. underdog story with executives at a shoe company that you know is now and has been huge. Yeah. Nike executives. It makes you want them to succeed. Right. You know, you know they do. <laughs> and they become a huge corporation. That but we this are, is that, a weird, like, this is like a weird consumer, like, consumerism fairy tale genre that's happening now, though. It, it really this is. This is the whole subgenre. Because you had the Blackberry movie, you had all the Steve Jobs movies. Right. Like, I, like, the whole, yeah. like, Colin, you said, like, an executive underdog is like a weird subgenre. <laughs> it it yeah. really is. Because you know these fuckers got rich off of them. <laughs> yeah, but it's I mean, that, it's that kind of it does have that rocky vibe it to does, it, right? Yeah. Where it has it because it has Matt Damon as this schlub, like who goes around and you know he's the guy who has to try and and find these guys and and sign them, and so you really kind of get behind him because it becomes like a do or die, you know, situation for this right, guy. Because we all because I, and, it, and we all want to see Matt Damon do well at his job. That has become a subgenre of movie. Yeah, who we'll just go through and look at him. It's like we want Matt Damon to do well because he plays characters that actually want to do well. Holy shit, Michaela just showed up on my screen. It's the time I've seen her all night. Um, oh, but, good. Glad I but, could finally join you. Yeah, you disappeared. For mine, for the record. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> okay, it. But you want, you want, you, you want these characters to do well because at this point in time, they are not doing well. They are down on their luck. They are trying to do uh, the best that they can. It is if you, you know, uh, eschew the, you know, that it's a giant corporation trying to make money, which is basically what all. I was gonna say honestly, to like the more you talk about, it, the more I'm like, this is the social network all over again. Yeah, and I love the social network. Yeah. And I hate it. it. <laughs> <laughs> which is fine, Holly, but I, I, I guess that I think you saw that movie too late because you saw it like what two years ago. It, was it two years ago? Was it last year? I don't remember. Uh, I didn't see it. Yeah, but, it's not too late. It's but never Air, too late to hate that movie. Air uh, makes it like. Air makes it's like it's it's one of those movies that makes all the the machinations that are going on here like nail biting, right? Like, yes. there's so much on the line to you know uh, get this part or get that part. They have to go through uh, Michael Jordan's mom, uh, who yes. becomes basically who his. Viola Davis in this movie. Yeah, and she's like fiercely okay. protective, and you know, I mean, I guess by, based on all accounts, because I I read an interview uh, with Ben Affleck who did talk to Jordan about like you know okay we're doing this movie and you know and he's like you know talk to my mom because it was you know make sure it's about his mom because he sees his mom i think as uh really uh shepherding that early and protecting him and getting him the deal because she's a fierce negotiator in yeah. the movie you yeah, know she is um yeah, she got him deals that were unprecedented at the time because he got uh, from this. He got like uh, a cut of every every sale of every shoe. 
yeah. went to Jordan. Yeah, which really is unheard of. Unheard of deals yeah. and everything in this movie. Viola Davis has his mom becomes like because Michael Jordan is in the movie, but he is not one. They don't show that his face in the entire movie. Yeah, like he because who's going to play him? Really, I mean, well, you, you know, right, he you looms so right. large. You can't you know. cast Michael Jordan. It's impossible. Well, isn't he notoriously like litigious about showing his face and things he doesn't sign off on too? Well, that, that, he is that, but also that wasn't, um, I don't think that was, um, the litigiousness of it wasn't part of why they didn't show him in the movie. It was more so that I, he, he is a big part of it, but the focus, as Colin just said, is more on other people as far as getting the deal done and the history of it. Yeah, the deal making is almost like you don't get to talk to him until, you know, you got to go through all these other people, you know, before we can even reach out and talk to the guy, you know. Right. The final plea does go to Jordan, and the final plea is done by Matt Jane at a conference table directly to him at the end, and it's great, and he makes great points. He's like, no one at this table will ever be remembered, but you will. And, and, you know, it's a great speech at the end that convinces that a lot of things, but it's one of the key moments that convinces Michael to sign with my uh, with Nike, and it kind of changes it changes Michael's future, it changes Nike's future. It, it's fascinating. It's, it's basically it's um, uh, a high level documentary, I'll say. You know, you know um, because it's showing it's the same reasons I would be fascinated with a documentary showing this whole. Uh, process of getting Michael to sign with Nike and making the shoes and what they had to do and paying the fines he would get for every time he stepped in the court. Um, I think it's a great story. I think everyone, I mean, plus Matt, the cat, Matt Damon, um, Jason Bateman is great in it doing, you know, his Jason Bateman uh, stuff. Um, it, ben Affleck in a uh, uh, a Jerry Curl mullet almost. In, was, it, was it Chris Messina? Is the. Chris Messina. Uh, yeah, yeah, he is yeah, yeah. great. <laughs> Uh, great Chris Messina is a fucking out of control. Like, is it Michael Michael Jordan's agent? I think. Mm. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, yeah. Chris Messina's fantastic, and his. I like Chris Messina. Yeah, he's great in this movie. Yeah, and there's a lot of. I mean, oh, like Ben Affleck in uh, the Windbreaker suits, sweatsuits. Uh, it, it's <laughs> it's fantastic. Like it is. It's a dad movie for sure, one hundred percent. But it's also <laughs> just a really well told story uh but i uh, by i think um really good filmmakers and also i think the fact that i most of these guys are really good friends it, it helps in that comfortableness uh getting into all of it and they're all comfortable with each other and we re- and you know like working with each other and a lot of that really comes across in this movie so i mean air uh yeah dad movie of the year but also just really good and you know just really um and not a life or death story, nothing like that. Just kind of, it, it's lighter than air. Oh, but it no, feels like, like, I mean, it does kind of feel like, you know, I mean, they give it stakes. I think that's you know, why it it's stakes. exciting. But right. I remember thinking when they announced that movie, I was sitting there going like, you know, it's like, well, if everybody's getting kind of, you know, uh, there's no, the kids today don't have uh, G.I. Joe or Transformers or whatever toys, right? I mean, like, I, I suppose you could adapt Fortnite or something. It's like, what appeals to sure. them? It's like, but every single kid wants a, a a Jordan for well, or a Nike shoe for Christmas, you know, <laughs> he's like massively expensive, crazy collector shoes. I mean, it's like, and I, you know, I know there's a, a bunch of people into cars. I was like, and they're making a Ferrari movie. It's like they're, they're tapping into, uh, you know, like, these other well-known i mean hollywood's basically still doing what they have always done right. it's just now they're going after like real life stuff that like you have you, you know an interest in the shoes well right here's the story of the air jordan <laughs> yeah, which everyone everyone knows the air jordan like mm. like it is the shoe and here's the story of that and so when you you know associate those things it makes for like you said colin it gives them stakes when you know the outcome of the movie and for a movie to give it stakes and kind of, uh, uh, you know, make you want to watch to see what happens, even though you already know what's going to happen. I mean, that's a good movie to me. So air number four, 
There it is. Thank you, Michaela, for knowing me. <laughs> At least for one dead movie up here. You were talking about that movie like before it came out, and then you went and saw it, and I was like, he's on a whole journey with this movie. <laughs> oh, that's, that's like that, yeah, that whole thing. Like, oh, loved it, loved it, loved it. All right. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we should be higher on Earth. I don't know. Um, uh, Sean, have you ever watched the TV show Silicon Valley? Uh, I watched the first two seasons of it, and then I fell off. Because that is a whole show about underdogs trying to become executives. Right, but they don't become executives of anything I know. It's all fictional. So I'm, I, I, it got me for two seasons, which I really did like. Uh, oh, you I need know. real world stakes to invest. Yeah. They have to tap into Sean's consumerism specifically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Something I, can I really need that uh, capitalism consumerism thing to really hit me at center. <laughs> this movie did. I mean, Nike must have loved this movie. Uh, and, and just for a, from a PR standpoint, I bet. It must have been must have been great for them. Oh yeah, and uh, and I recognize that yes, this will help sell shoes and Jordans and everything. But you know what? Okay, that's fine. Made me feel good, and, and uh, that is uh, corporate consumerism uh, at its worst slash best. So what are you going to do? <laughs> I accept it for this movie. Number four air for me, Holly. What is your number four for the year? My number four, um, again, it was an unexpected movie that I just stumbled upon. My number four is Reptile. Uh, it was oh, a oh, net- this movie. oh, yeah. Is this the cop movie? This is the cop movie, yeah. This Shit. is a police... This is, I gotta watch this movie. I haven't even police, heard of this. What is it? It is a police procedural movie. Uh, it's, a, it's a detective movie. Uh, it's a Netflix movie starring uh, Benicio Del Toro. Lacey Silverstone and Justin Timberlake. There you go. Um, yeah, it's it was surprising. This movie. I mean, we've talked about detective movies on this show endlessly, and I will never stop talking about them because I will always have that itch that needs to be scratched. I love detective movies. We all know our passion for like Zodiac and True Detective, yep. and this definitely has those vibes. It is a slow burn for sure, but it is a solid movie and a Netflix original. But it is solid; like it, it had me. Um, Benicio del Toro is fantastic, and I think he he helped. I think he helped write it. Uh, maybe those. I don't know if he did the screen. He did do the screenplay. Maybe he did the story. What's it about? I'm not sure. I've never oh, heard of so, it. So, um, yeah. yeah. So Benicio del Toro plays a detective in New England, and he comes across this case that um, it's Justin Timberlake's wife is murdered. He's a Justin Timberlake's a realtor. His wife is murdered and it's Benicio Del Toro's case. So he's trying to solve it. And within his like process, um, he's kind of like learning more about his, his um, precincts and the people around him. And it's just, it's a grander mystery than, than what he initially uh, figures to be and it's just I, I don't want to give anything away um yeah please don't because i still i don't want to give anything away it's and, so hard and, to like talk Toro, about it and Doug toro was one of the writers of the screenplay yes I, I yeah i knew he had a part in writing it um it's like i said it, it really does have those like true detective or like zodiac vibes slow burn but it's it's just so well done like benicio del toro is just absolutely fantastic this is the movie I wanted kill- the killer to be. Okay. So I-, I didn't like the killer. I thought it was boring as fuck. Oh, no. Um, I love the killer. It was a- <laughs> I hated it. It was so boring. I struggled big time. With oh, man. Yes. See, this is one of the movies that I'm, I'm just like, I haven't even gotten to the killer yet. So I, I can't no. get it. Yeah, no. This is what I wanted the killer to be, is this movie. It's 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 the, 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 the Fincher movie I wanted. <laughs> Fincher didn't do. <laughs> um. So yeah, it's. I don't know what I can say about it without giving anything away because it really is like that kind of movie that you just have to watch and see what happens. Um, but it's it's a great police procedural. Um, I. I I love that Benicio del Toro and Elisa Silverstone got like a second chance because do you remember Excess Baggage? <laughs> That movie was shit. Yeah. Oh, wow, forgot about that movie. <laughs> it was shit. And it's like they finally got to do a movie together that, like, is they're both really good in this movie. Good. <laughs> this is their second chance. Right. We need more Alicia Silverstone because what was yes. the last thing she was in? The Cabin or The, I, the Lodge? Oh, the Lodge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She wasn't in it for that long. 
Yeah, they're both fantastic in this movie. It's it's so good. Um, Justin Timberlake is doing really fantastic with with this character. Um, it's good. It's not a character I've seen him really do. Um, I know you hate. I know you hate the Social Network. What did you Justin Timberlake in it? I actually like him. I I I think he's a fine actor. He's I, pretty I, good. He's pretty I, good. I yeah. I think we did the Time movie too, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I in time. In time, yeah. Yeah, I don't have an issue uh, with him as an actor. I think okay. he's fine. He's he's really good in the most depressing movie that's ever been made, Alpha Dog. Oh, Alpha Dog! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it really is. Don't ever, if anyone okay. ever makes me watch that fucking movie again, I swear <laughs> to God, that that oh, can't unsee that movie. Especially now, considering. Well, yeah, 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 and so, based on a true story yeah. at all as well. Yeah. 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 Uh. Um. Yeah, so this movie, um, I know the the death that he is investigating, that Benicio Del Toro is investigating, is loosely based on a true investigation. Um, I don't know much about that, true, true crime-wise, I don't know much about that. Um, but he's, he's doing great work on this. There's a, there's a really fantastic scene with him and his partner are in the house of uh, Justin Timberlake, you know, asking him questions about his wife and everything about the murder. And it's like very, like the tone is very dark and very suspect. And Biggie Silvertor is just like wandering around the kitchen, like looking around. And he just suddenly he looks at his partner and he's like, I love this kitchen. <laughs> and it's so funny. Like there's little moments like that that I'm like, he's perfect. This is everything I want it to be. <laughs> So yeah, I, it's it's a great movie. It's slow burn. Um, yeah, it's it. You have to watch it. It's it's what I wanted the killer to be. Sorry, Colin, but it is. Um, so yeah, Reptile is my is my next one uh, on my list. It is. Uh, you know, like I said, I never heard of it. I heard of the killer. <clears throat> you wonder because I guess you get advertised. <clears throat> Stuff appears on your feed, right, mm-hmm. on your social media networks that's tailored to you, and they must know that I like David Fincher, right? Yeah. So I knew that The Killer existed, mm-hmm. and I had heard of Maestro, but I didn't know when Maestro was coming out. The Killer, I knew when it was coming out. And mm-hmm. this one I never heard of, but, I mean, I'm into that type of movie. It's well, just- I remember, like, a few months ago, we were talking before the show one night, and I was like, oh, yeah, there's that new Fincher movie coming out. And all of you were like, What? Richard's got a new movie coming out. Like, it just wasn't talked about. Yeah, this is the curse of uh, Netflix streaming. So how did yeah. you find it? How did you find Reptile? I, I really don't know. It just popped up somewhere in, it, in it one of my radars. Probably, it was probably, like, random clips showed up on social media because that's how I saw. Because I only remember, like, I saw Benicio Del Toro and just mm-hmm. like, in a scene together. I'm like, what the hell is this? Right you know what? In a very, I think I follow Alicia Silverstone on on Instagram, so it could have been that she posted something about it. I don't know, but it just like popped up, and I was like, "I'm gonna check this out." And mm. yeah, I was not disappointed. The state of the movie industry sucks. Okay, yeah, it just sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Make movies important again. <laughs> there we go. Short, short, and important. Yeah, yeah. seriously. But yeah, yeah, my number four is Reptile. Good stuff. Michaela, number four. All right. My number four is Talk to Me. Um, I just watched this for the first time like two weeks ago, so it's still pretty fresh in my memory. Uh, I did not see it over the summer when it came out like everybody else did. But um, I was pleasantly surprised. Like, I I feel like the premise is pretty slim and something you've probably seen and heard before, but it's executed really well. So to me, that doesn't really matter, you know? Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, um, I I think it was a really, really good portrayal of teenagers. Like, we talk about a lot in this show, like, so many movies get it so wrong, so wrong. And, like, these kids felt like kids I went to high school with. These felt like parties I went to. They, they had that perfect, like, the perfect teenager balance is you have to balance that, like, selfish drive where, like, you come first with the, like, I'm also immortal and I'm going to live forever. Yep. The mentality that teenagers have, and this movie really nailed that. Like, kids do think they're invincible at that age, and they it, don't it, give a it, shit. No, it's funny that they think they're invincible, and yeah. they, they really don't realize that they're not. Like, yeah, yeah it's, it's, they have no concept of health insurance. They don't understand like things like that. You know, <laughs> no. um, life. But I love that they took a possession movie and made it like, what if you could microdose being possessed? And it was, felt really <laughs> awesome, you know? Like, 
you actually talk about how it feels good. And I was like, okay, because I was about to have a big problem with the movie if they didn't explain what the appeal was of yeah. being possessed. <laughs> um, like because it, it yeah, because from the audience perspective, it does not look fun. So like mm-hmm. they needed to explain that and they did a good job. And I felt like the rules they established were just enough. It wasn't too many and it also wasn't too vague. Um, right. It's also enough that it's only what the teenagers can conceive of because they only right. think that the 90 minute thing is because I think somebody went that far and came out or 90, uh, 90 minute, 90, whatever it is, and yeah. came out of it and they were fine. They're like, all right, that's the limit only because they don't know how far it can go. And right. They decided on that, yeah. The only thing I can really knock this movie for is, and it's not just this movie, it's a symptom of a bigger problem, but. I am so tired of grief and trauma being like the main point of a movie, specifically horror movies. It seems to be in horror movies a lot lately, but like it can just be about a guy killing people. It doesn't have to be any deeper than that, you know, Mm -hmm. like and the whole thing with her mom and her mom's suicide. It was like, Jesus, you're really piling on the bleak shit onto this movie. You know, (laughs) like it could just be a possession movie. It doesn't have to be also her resolving her grief over her losing her mom. It doesn't have to be well, it that. It gives her um, motivation. I guess that was the the way I saw it. It was the motivator for her to to violate the, the primary rule of the you know the ninety right. minutes. Right. But this and, is the thing in movies now of how count how many movies when you go to the theaters now someone has both parents still alive. Oh, <laughs> it's it's none of them. I, like, like, this is I'm so tired of it being like oh I tragically lost my parent and that's it's almost character. it's almost if you have two parents alive you're a fucking loser. It's just like, yeah, oh, like it's, I mean I'm you know like I'm thinking about most of the movies we saw this year like most of the horror movies that came out one parent that's almost all of them and it's it's to me it's just cheap and it's a lazy way to create emotional motivation for your character uh, like killing off a of parents uh, a parent of a child in movies is the new like killing the wife or girlfriend it is what it feels like and i'm just like it feels cheap and it feels lazy and it feels predictable and that's the only thing i can really knock this movie for but i mean that's a minor gripe with you know and like i said it's not just this movie it's most movies now especially horror movies no one has two parents in horror movies anymore <laughs> no one uh but yeah I really and if they do and one of them is brutally murdered at the beginning in the cold it, 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 yeah they're only living long enough so they can be batman you know like it's <laughs> yeah. it, so um yeah and maybe i'll talk about that again when it appears in another movie on my list because it was the theme this year so yeah. um but that yeah number four is talk to me colin what's your uh number three Number three. All right. Still going on the uh, trend of uh, the movies. Uh, Like I said, these are maybe not the best movies of the year, but like I have seen this movie three times. Uh, I had such a good time watching it. And it is Gran Turismo. Uh, Yeah. So. Now, <laughs> this is turn to movie. I know because I, I I actually was unprepared to like this movie as much as I did, and so much so that, like I said, I've seen it three times. It's like this year's Top Gun Maverick. Um, oh, damn. The story is unbelievable, but true. Like I went and looked it up and basically all the events in the movie, they may be out of order, but are the true story of Jan Mardenborough, who was this kid who played video games, right? He played Gran Turismo. It's the the ultimate fantasy column. It feels, yeah, it's the last (laughs) starfighter of 2023 yes, yes, right yes, because i'm like yeah, i've like seen this story before it was the last starfighter <laughs> and so he sits in his bedroom and he plays a video game and nissan which is called nissan in the movie so we've all been saying it wrong apparently uh has orlando bloom is a marketing exec over there who makes an astute uh, observation he's like kids today play video games they uber around and they do all this other stuff and they don't have a love for the open road he's talking to nissan executives and he's like but the players of gran turismo which is a real video game for the playstation he's like they actually do and so what if we could prove right this is like your entire like an untapped audience base we'll go to those players and see if the skills that they have learned sitting on their couch <laughs> translate into driving real race cars not not just driving we're saying going like 240 miles an hour in a race car in a rocket right yeah and 
this this is what's unbelievable to me about this story. Like you'd think that they made this up, but this is like a real deal. This this, kid, is, this is also like every parent's worst nightmare on the yeah. flip side. <laughs> is that every kid who sits down playing video games is gonna watch through like look, look, see what I'm doing could turn into something someday. I know, but who would have thought? I mean, I guess it's you know, I mean, because you when you think about it, you're like, well, okay, it's a it's a movie based on a on a video game. I guess I, it's what not like there's no plot taken because the game is a racing simulator. So this yes. is a, a weird, which has been around for like 20 something years. Yeah. So it's a, it's an odd thing to take, but I guess there was this real life story about this kid who was the best in the GT Academy that Nissan put on and then became like a real race car driver and actually had a podium podiumed at Le Mans. Like, wow. Like, <laughs> like Le the Ma- elite. Le Mans? Wow. <laughs> yeah. So you're like, what? Like when you're watching it, you can't believe this is true. I had to go like, look it up. And sure enough, the actual Jan Mardenborough plays, he's like the, uh, he, he did the stunt car driving in the movie. It's uh, Neil Blomkamp directed it. The guy who did district nine right, and yeah. Chappie and, and Elysium. Um, but the the standout so you know you're like okay I know that this is it's meant to sell copies of the, the video game right I mean but I mean what better like spell, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 but you're like this what is better this is this movie is basically saying that this video game will teach you how to drive teach you how to race like it's so accurate you know um so i mean that's you know if you come away believing that i don't know i mean again it must be true that they 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 put he was uh, in real life i guess he was not the first person to go through this there had been several and they all ended up racing but i think he was like one of the more uh successful ones but the um the real mvp of the movie is uh david harbour um, from Stranger Things, nice. who has been pursuing one of those careers um, where I, I like what he's doing as far as, okay, I'm a, I'm a star on, on Stranger Things, but I'm trying to parlay that into um, both starring roles and s- some stuff that doesn't work out so well, like Hellboy. Uh, sure, the, and some good character work. Yeah, Violent Night, I think, was a success, but he's like, he's trying to, you know, do the, the old school actor graduate up through the ranks, you know, actually appear in character moments in, in these movies, and he turns in, like, really good work. I mean, he's basically, I think the, the movie's basically, he comes down to, like, uh, it's like a surrogate father real father he, he the, the does region. That, right he does that very well oh and i just this just popped into my head how do you think he'd be like is he like a, a version of like the new bruce willis think of like david harbour doing like die hard like, yeah he, yeah yeah i could do that he could do that he could pull that off the sarcasm kind of like the real life quote unquote ness to it but he I, he serves that role very well yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, he's very good. At, I mean, he's basically cast as the uh he's the former race car driver who never really made it, right? Who's yep. become a mechanic for like a racing team and is, you know, Orlando Bloom's character eventually reaches out to him to like you got to coach the you got to lead this GT Academy. And he's the guy who's like all of you suck. You're all, you know, playing video <laughs> games and there's no way this is going to work. And then you yep. watch him kind of gradually um you know, soften. He, he gets the lines like, you impressed me, kid. Good job. <laughs> it's been a hard ass for a half hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's it, like, like, he's he like can... this kid's got something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there's a, yeah. a respect, a kind of begrudging respect that it's like, oh, the kid actually can do it. And then that kind of reignites his like, you know, oh, I remember what it was like to, you know, when the car is doing this and you, you feel like that, you know. And uh, then, this is you know. everything Colin is feeling when he's at his uh, PlayStation four controller steering wheel oh yeah but, well, <laughs> see that's the other thing like i say i've, I've seen it three times i i play the video <laughs> game i was playing yes. the video game before the movie came out and uh so <laughs> you know you're like oh yeah you know, um yeah i don't know I, I the the thing i guess also that i kind of like is um the recreations if you're into racing it's the recreations of like real world tracks uh it feels very real 
you know, I've seen even Ford versus Ferrari, which is, right. I think, a better movie than this. I mean, it's an excellent film, yes. but use CG in a way that, like, I could tell. Uh, this yes. one might be using CG, but I can't tell. It feels like real. The races are exciting, and um, you know, there's rivalry between other players. There's our players, other racers, you know, because they're like your video game kid. So, you know, it's that okay. against all odds kind of he's got to prove himself. And I mean, it sounds formulaic, and I guess that it is, but it was, you know, I was I was looking like at him like said, if you do it well. You do it right well because uh, I looked up the writers. Uh, one of them, like I said, wrote Creed Three, and the other one wrote American Sniper. And it's like, so these aren't like, uh, you know, you're just pulling some guy off the street to, you know, write his first movie. It's like right. they know how to make this kind of movie. And so if you, I, I guess I'm making the appeal that if you uh, overlooked Gran Turismo, it's like, okay, it's another video game or it's about racing or whatever. I think you should give it. Uh, a look because it's actually like a, a pretty good movie it was a, it was one of the best i guess you know you used to have like audience experiences but it it was it was just it was a it was a fun i i got you know like uh it was extremely entertaining and and i just i really enjoyed it so um gran turismo number three sean what's your number three um i want to go back and say something about the writers i think it's zach Balin. Zach Balin. Okay, he's Creed yeah, Three, King yeah. Richard, and Gran Turismo. Yes, yeah, Balin. Yeah, and it's like and, Jason and, Hall or something. Or yeah. is he the and other one? The, he's the Crow, the new Crow. Mm-hmm. He's the writer on that. And a uh, Bob Mar- Bob Marley movie apparently coming. Out. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I see that. Oh, he and wrote that too. Yeah, okay, so I guess that well. that's what I'm saying. This is the pedigree behind it. Like, don't overlook right. it. I mean, it's Neil Blomkamp, right? Uh, and, and these writers. And it's it's a very well put together movie. If you're just like you know, okay, it's an ad for a, a, a PlayStation like, it game. Very, it looks very slick and PlayStation and all that stuff, but it's got some substance to it. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's yeah, arousing. And that, and that it's substance. it's an aspirational yeah. film, I guess. An aspirational and that's hero. Fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine as long as it pulls that off well, which it sounds like it does. Yeah, you root for the kid, you know. Yeah, good. As long as you get them and root for them, if they make you feel like you need to root for them, that's that's doing. What it needs to do. Yeah. All right. Uh, my number three for 2023 is a tie. Oh, come on. Sean. Sean. <laughs> no. Jaden. All right. No, All right, so we're bumping the old man in the foot, right? Or whatever. And then, what, what was it? The old man in the the fool? Bumping that. <laughs> what are you doing here? All right, no. Now, the tie is between two animated films because I wanted to highlight the sort of uh, really good animation and storytelling we had this year. So, my tie for number three is Across the Spider Verse and also Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Now, these, because of these two, they share kind of a similar uh, kind of storyline and arc. You know, it's about the younger heroes kind of growing up into who we know they will eventually be. We've got a young Spider-Man and a young Ninja Turtles kind of trying to figure out who they will because there's a lot of backstory to this, and plus there's a history to both these characters. We know where they're going to end up, but we like, I think, at certain points... Uh, you know, not everyone likes a prequel, but sometimes we do like to see how a character gets to where we know them. And we Sean love the coming of age story. Love, you know what? If they do it right, it may because I'm a dad, and I and I know that <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's a cheap way of explaining why I like these movies. But I, I'm a dad, and it, it reminds me of being a dad because they explore a lot of those themes. Um, and and the way some of them are written, it really reminds me of my kid my son, my 12-year-old, and the experiences he goes through, they, they really do hit on some of the dialogue that my kid and and his generation uses, which is very funny to, like, see it in real life and then see it reflected in uh, an animated movie. It's, it, it is, it's really fun for me. But it's really, like, Across the Spider-Verse is, I think... It's one of the uh, the better movies of the year. It's a great story. It's a continuation of Into the Spider Verse from I think a few years ago. Um, I think what you really focus on story and animation. The stories are 
if not familiar, they're still good because they all, they all are coming of age stories. They're all about finding what you're supposed to do in life, and you you trip up and you make mistakes, you know, on your way there. Um, but you still get there, and it's still something you can cheer for. Uh, but also, the animation of these movies, I think, is fantastic. In, Across the Spider Verse is one of, I think, the most beautiful, like. Um, artistic movies of the year, like you could frame a lot of the shots in Across the Spider Verse as just like it's like beautiful watercolors at certain points, and they go from that to like stuttery animation to really uh, a, just great. It's a great spectrum of animation that is combined in these movies. Ninja Turtles is more of a it's more of a grimy, gritty, hand drawn. Thing where it's it's messier, but it's but it works for the story of the you know, four turtles who come from a sewer who have a rat for a father. Their animations can be a little messier and a little more smudged, but the characters they come up with throughout both of these movies are they really play well with the main characters. I I, I don't think I la- I laugh so much during the opening like. 30 minutes of Across the Spider-Verse when he's dealing with, because you have the opening act villain you have to deal with who, you know, you, you deal with him, but he ends up coming back later as the big villain of the movie, and it's it's really great storytelling, it's a really great animation, it's like, it's a visual feast for the eyes, and they're telling familiar stories, but when you do that combined with a greater um, uh, a greater ability to animate it and, you know, the animation makes you feel a lot more than maybe previous versions of these characters uh, uh, that you've seen. It, they're really heartfelt stories, and the animation behind it is really backing it up. Um, I think, like, um, I, I may have done a, a strange look or two when I mentioned the, well, I mean, it's a tie, but the animated films, but they're really, like... They're really doing good in this arena. This is what I was talking about earlier when I said Marvel's on the downfall, but they're also doing different aspects that are really kicking ass. And I think the Into the Spider-Verse, Across the Spider-Verse, and then next year's Beyond the Spider-Verse um, are really doing very well at the storytelling and the arts of these characters. And the animation really backs it up and enforces the story they're trying to tell. And it really gets, it, it's funny, it's emotional. I've had feelings throughout all of these. Um, and it's, it, it's, I think it's really good storytelling. And they're, they're really doing, and it's fun. I mean, the, the Turtles movie was uh, written by team, uh, it's Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. You know, the guys behind Superbad made a Turtles movie. And the comedy is really great because it's, it's overlapping dialogue. It's jokes that if you aren't listening or paying attention will pass you by. But if you catch them they're really funny um it's very entertaining stuff and it, it's really enjoyable and you know uh uh in the year 2023 which was i mean may have been a struggle for most folks it was for me to find levity and jokes and entertainment in the stuff you're watching um because i watched a lot of downer stuff as well throughout the years documentaries mm-hmm. and movies and everything and horror movies and stuff that's not so you know positive Finding the positive in this year came in these two movies, and it really is more... They get serious, but it is lighthearted, and it is funny, and it really ends up in a good place where you feel good. You feel good when you're done with the movie, and that's really what came across in these two movies. And, you know, you want to spotlight the animation, because you know the artists work hard on the stuff, and it really is beautiful. Go watch Across the Spider-Verse. There's some beautiful stuff in that movie. Um, I, I think it's really entertaining, and from an artistic standpoint, really, you know, it's top-tier stuff. So it's going to be those two movies from the, my number three. Uh, Across the Spider-Verse and Mutant Mayhem, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, my number three. Holly, what is your number three for this year? My number three was a movie experience for me. Uh, my, my number three is four things. Is this the one you did? You take a friend of this? I did. I took my friend Jenna and did you traumatize her. Okay. I traumatized the fuck out of this girl. So yeah. When you gave us your <laughs> very, uh, slight <laughs> review of it, that it was uh, it was something else. I, I did yeah. research and I'm like, oh, I understand why. Yeah, bring, bring somebody else with you would traumatize them. Yes, so I I 
took my, my friend Jenna, my poor, sweet friend Jenna. She, um, she doesn't own a TV, and she hadn't been to a movie in, like, 20 years. Right? Oh, no. What did I do? <laughs> I took her to this movie. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, like, it worked out really well because I was um, originally supposed to see it with my friend Drew, and he couldn't. And I am so glad that I didn't see that movie with him. <laughs> because it is it, I I challenge you to find someone to watch that movie with that won't make you feel awkward. It's not possible. It's no. not possible. Um, I can't imagine. So this is it, uh it's it's more this is like an art film retelling of the Bride of Frankenstein. Um uh, Bride of Frankenstein more like yeah, more like Frankenstein, really. Um it, it's it, Frankenstein it, Frank Frank finding his sexuality. Kind of, yeah, no, like, when she asked, she was like, so I don't know anything about this movie, what, what are we saying? And I was like, oh, well, it's kind of, like, a feminist Frankenstein, is <laughs> how I put it. <laughs> um, this movie is batshit crazy, it's a banana sandwich. Um, it's, it's Emma Stone, Mark Ruffalo, Willem Dafoe. Um, Willem Dafoe is the... Dr. Frankenstein character. Um, this is a Yor- uh, Yorgos Lanthimos? It is. So, the so, so like deer, lobster, um, the, the favorite. favorite. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, if you know any of his stuff, like, you know, it's going to be a crazy movie. Um, and Emma Stone is sublime in this movie. She's so wonderful. She, basically, the, um, Willem Dafoe's character, the Dr. Frankenstein's character, who's, like, grossly deformed and scarred, and he's kind of a Frankenstein himself a little bit, um, but he is an experimental doctor, and he puts a baby brain in in a woman corpse body, um, and so it's basically Emma Stone is, like, a full-grown woman, but she's got the mind of a baby, so she's basically, like, growing up, learning about life, learning about all these things. Perfect. And that's really the whole movie of, like, her experiencing life and experiencing all of the things that a person experiences, but in, like, a rapid pace. And it's just shocking, and it's grotesque, and it's awful and hilarious. And it made me feel like every single emotion you can feel in one viewing experience. I I couldn't look away. It's just a horrific movie that I could not look away from for a second. Jenna, there were so many moments that Jenna was like hugging her knees and like looking away, and I had to tell her when parts were over. She was just horrified, <laughs> but she also didn't hate it. Like that's the that's the part about this movie that's just crazy. It's so gross and so weird, but it's also just endearing and charming and gorgeous. It's it's a stunning movie. It's so beautiful. Um, it's this kind of like um, like sci-fi, like steampunk Victorian world kind of thing. Right. Um, you know, so it's it's like this fantastical world that's kind of familiar, but it's kind of out of the ordinary. It, it, so it's it's just a completely surreal experience. Yeah, this is a surreal art movie. Um, and it just it floored me. I, I I walked out of there in shock. I was like, that was a legit movie experience. You know, I feel like there's not many of those anymore. Like, you go to a movie and you're just like, I am not going to forget about this for, like, ever. Like, it's just going to stay with me in the best way and the worst way. Traumatizing, gorgeous. All of the above. Um, Mark Ruffalo is hilarious. Like, there is some dialogue in this movie. It is, it is based on a book. Um, yeah, there's some dialogue in this movie that is just uh, amazing. My friend Jen is a poet. She's a writer. So, like, a lot of the, the writing in this movie, she was just like, this is amazing. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and some of it's just so funny. But, man, it, it is a movie that's going to stay with you. A lot of it really is horrifying and really gross, and it's unbelievably uncomfortable. Um, a lot of this movie really is like Frankenstein, uh, the Frankenstein character, her name's Bella. Bella discovering her sexuality is 90% of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets really graphic. Um, but man, it's, it is something. Like, it is a spectacle. Um, 
it's it's definitely an art kind of movie. I don't recommend it for everyone, but for for our audience, for us, I would say like it's it's an experience that you need to have watching this movie. Um, be very careful who you watch it with. Probably watch it alone. <laughs> oh, I will. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it, it's pretty incredible. Everyone is doing such a great job. Um, yeah, this looked like one of the movies, like, when I saw the trail, like, okay, I need to see this movie. Yeah, it, it just sort of, it looks like an exploration of a lot of things. It is, that's exactly what it is. It explores so many things. It is, it, like, it's an ending me feel like a million different emotions watching it. Um, and yeah, it, it's gonna stick with you. So I, I, I recommend it if you, if you want an experience at the movies that, we just don't get anymore. Um, yeah. So that's that's my number three is is four things. Okay. What's your number three? <laughs> okay. My number three is uh Godzilla minus one. Nice. Um, I still want to see this movie. That was a runner so, up for me. My kid yeah. has to block me on Godzilla and I will never forgive him. I wanna see this movie. Um so this movie um <laughs> Uh, made me wonder how many great movies from Japan we are missing out on because people in America won't read subtitles. Like, holy shit. Um, And this movie had, like, a crazy word-of-mouth kind of explosion after it finally came out over here. Um, But this movie is really, like, a perfect portrait of how war destroys, like, the individual as well as the collective. Um, It has a lot of self-reflective thoughts about how Japan handled uh, World War II in general. Um, and how it handled the aftermath of that. Um, I can't imagine America ever making a movie that takes this much responsibility for atrocities. <laughs> um, right, or would ever look at itself as it, responsible it, for those atrocities. Exactly, exactly. Wait, like, Oppenheimer came out this year. Yeah, <laughs> yes. But, yeah, but that, that was also, spoiler, one of my most disappointing movies of the year, but continue on. With yeah, it's, I don't know, this felt more repentant than Oppenheimer did. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it, this, oh man, it's, it sounds really bad to be like, it's so cool that it takes place in 1940s Japan, but like setting Godzilla solely in 1940s Japan post-war is really interesting. Like it's, it's the Godzilla period piece, you know, like, um, it's, if, if, if Shin Godzilla from 2016 is like your science Godzilla movie, this is your history Godzilla movie. Um, nice. And uh, I I cannot believe this movie was made for $15 million because it, it did yeah, not look like it. It looks better than any Marvel movie of the past five years. Like it, wow. it, it, and not even just the Godzilla effects, but like the like period effects and the clothing and the, the set design is just absolutely fantastic it's a beautiful movie to look at um it really balances a well-rounded like human story with really cool monster stuff like don't get me wrong this is a good godzilla movie he fucks shit up and it is legitimately <laughs> it is legitimately terrifying at moments as long like, as he fucks it up that's what he we does want to do. He does. There were some moments where I could really like feel my anxiety because it was just like really tense. There's like this movie actually has like suspenseful moments with Godzilla, which I feel like you don't usually get suspense. He's not he's not a subtle guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a there's that scene where he's he's chasing a tugboat he's, and it's just he, he has these prey unblinking this eyes. Yeah. And I thought that they like borrowed a lot from like this movie was borrowing I think from like Christopher Nolan, uh, oh, you know, it's like it exists because third act reveal especially. there's a lot of like Dunkirk <laughs> in it where it's like actually yeah. the citizen citizenry of, of Japan kind of has to come together themselves in order to solve a problem because the government mm-hmm. is ineffective. That scene of the suspense you're talking about uses that hanging note that uh, yeah. Hans Zimmer used in, in Dunkirk. You know, they do a lot of that. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in, uh, in, in amping up the suspense. Yeah, and even like the first scene where Godzilla appears is like legitimately scary and suspenseful, and um, I mean they don't waste any time getting into the Godzilla action. And I like that this one shows a lot of his destruction from like the small human scale. Like uh, Marvel movies, we always see them like throwing each other through buildings, and the scale is very big, and we're not getting like 
boots on the ground kind of perspective. Right. This, That's, yeah. yeah. We look more forward to, uh, at least I do, like more of a smaller scale story with regards to like a bigger scale attack. Yeah. But what, did, like, what did you feel? The Gareth Edwards, uh, when he did that American. Bring that up, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> no, no, that, that kind of tried to do that, like from the perspective, the human perspective looking up. They were always big, the monsters. That, I find that movie extra embarrassing in retrospect compared to this movie because like that movie tried to have a human story with Aaron Taylor Johnson and his like dad and that just fell so flat and yet this movie like I was legitimately getting teary eyed at moments in this movie it got so emotional and like just seeing a man struggle with PTSD and like it's it's tough oh my god it's it's some tough moments um but Colin that like first scene when you first see Godzilla like he only kills like what like 12 people like it's not very many like but it's but it's horrifying the way it's done you know we're used to him killing like hundreds or thousands of times going through city but this is like a smaller you know situation but there's some legit scary moments uh some really scary pov shots and it's but the human story is so good and it's there's like there's a part in the movie where this woman is caring for a child that was um orphaned by air raids and everyone like is like well they always ask her like why are you taking care of a kid that's not yours and she's just like because and i like that kind of thought of like this is our future we have to protect it even if i don't have a personal investment in it like there's so much beautiful like symbolism like that to this movie on top of being an amazing monster movie so if every country going forward could process their national trauma through a monster movie I would love that, <laughs> and not and right, and not steal Godzilla to do it. Like no, we no, we don't need 1998. No, give Godzilla us your again. folklore. Yeah, no, no, no. Take your folklore, process your national trauma through it, and put it in a movie for us to watch. You know, like yes. so. I guess for us, that would be like Paul Bunyan representing nine eleven. <laughs> Right? I'm gonna quote I'm gonna quote you on that. <laughs> other people will take it. I'm gonna quote you on that. The Paul Bunyan movie that is an analogy for 9-11 is what I would like to see us do next. Um, <laughs> sure. Well, it was yeah. it was interesting to see, like, you know, a Japanese movie talking about, like, kamikaze pilots from the point of view of their, you know, not from the nationalistic kind of heroic point of view. It's like no, this, this guy. not pro-military. Because he's, right. he's yes. like, he's. I mean, I guess in essence, then a coward for not carrying out his kamikaze mission. And, and that kind of colors his emotional uh, landscape or psychological landscape. It's like he failed at this thing. And then, you know, so then he sees this opportunity with this giant monster. It's here's an opportunity for my redemption. I can, you know, complete a mission, but only now he actually feels it. It's like it's protecting the people who, uh, you know, know like the, of his community rather yeah, than just on government orders you know i guess yeah he's doing it for the right reasons this time yeah and i i liked the way male friendships were shown in this movie there was a lot of good male camaraderie and friendships and you know going on one last ride together shit like that <laughs> so it, it, yeah definitely check it out don't let the dub and subtitles stop you from a great movie yeah, Colin, it was, what's it was, your, uh, it was, well, it was easier to follow uh, than uh, than Shin Godzilla, which I think yes. is more of a challenge because that's rapid fire. That's like the bureaucracy dealing with uh, yes. disaster, right? Uh, where this one is, I mean, in essence, I guess like a uh, yeah, it's processing the the, the war trauma, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Colin, what's your number two pick, twenty twenty three? Uh, my number two pick. Okay, so. Going with um, best experiences of the year that I had. Um, this is, I think, the perfect marriage of uh, filmmaker sensibility and subject matter. Uh, this is 10 years in the making. We've been waiting for the Thanksgiving horror movie, and <laughs> Eli Roth has finally delivered Thanksgiving, right? He promised. Finally did what he said he was going to do. Yeah, many years ago with the the fake trailer that he did for Grindhouse, that double feature Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez did, right? I'll, I'll be covered. Yeah, because you you think I mean it's perfect, right? Like how many? It really is. Like nope. they hit it when they hit it when they made it many years ago. 
that's fine. It's good that they finally made good on that. It's the one slasher movie set on a holiday that hadn't been done. I mean, unless you count, you know, our uh, Saturday Night Freak Show favorite Blood Rage. I mean, I mean, but that's not. Blood Rage will always be the top, no matter what. <laughs> Um, but Thanksgiving, right, is a slasher movie, uh, not necessarily made the way that they used to make them. Um, it's set in Massachusetts. Um, or was it set in Plymouth? Uh, the, yes. the, the mm-hmm. killer adopts the, uh, persona of the real life, um, John Carver, perfectly named, uh, a real life character, uh, and starts killing people because it's a slasher movie because of an inciting incident, which is kind of, uh, re- creation i saw it before in krampus right krampus kind of did that uh black friday stampede uh it's done here like a final destination uh scene it sure is wow yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in, yeah. with fake uh rubber broken arms and everything yes yeah but that i think goes to like okay so you know it's like roth is obviously been a student of horror movies um you know he's made all these horror movies he hosts his own show on it right the history of horror (laughs) on amc he's always the guy that you go to whenever they want to talk to somebody about horror movies they interview eli roth so he's an encyclopedia of knowledge of the genre and he's an expert on slasher movies and it was when they said that you know he's finally making thanksgiving i'm sitting there going like this guy's never actually made a slasher movie and this seems like this is the subject that he knows the most about and so the important thing about that is and i think probably because he had 10 years to workshop it like he has figured out all the elements you need to have in a classic slasher movie but he's able to make his characters compelling he's thought them out and he's thought out all of the um, like the slasher set pieces, which is why you go to a slasher movie. So he doesn't skimp on the shock gore maimings and all no, that stuff. No, he does not. Right. Which uh, there, you know, I, I just I keep on thinking, you know, when you, when you say something like that, you sound like a bloodthirsty maniac, but there's something about, you know, when you, especially when you see it in an audience, there's this like laughter that escapes uh, when somebody's graphically uh, killed in a, in, a, in a good slasher movie because it's okay. you know you're appreciating the shock, the over the topness of the set piece, the artistry of how it's done, the 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 comedic sensibility in there because like you know you know yes. it's, I, I'm not to 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 add to that and to agree with you, Colin. I took my son to see this movie. (laughs) I forgot. Okay. Now, for a lot of things, I forgot that it was Eli Roth making this movie. Which was my first mistake in taking How? It's it, been his brainchild since no, oh, it was a trailer. It's always been Eli Roth Thanksgiving. No, uh, no but, <laughs> uh, but also I have, because Eli Roth, his filmmaking career, uh, for a, a while, like, I have um, maybe kind of ignored. I'm looking at Green Inferno uh, uh, as a big example. I forgot how extreme he will get. And, and so when I brought my son, I forgot how far you, Eli Roth will go as far as uh, the joke, the gore, and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I forgot all of that when I brought him to it. So when you talk about how it's unexpected for these things, like I forgot that he would go that far with these things. Um, but that's what that that is what he brings to it. Yeah. That because uh, yeah. I mean, my comparison was the same year we had Scream Six, right? <laughs> And which is wild. To yeah. Think about. Wild. Wild. So, so Thanksgiving, it doesn't feel like, I guess the trailer felt like, you know, it was a movie from the early eighties. Right. So, uh, you know, there was the thought of, okay, if he's making this movie, is he going to make like, I found an 80 slasher movie, but he doesn't, he makes a contemporary movie. I think he's justified in saying this is the contemporary remake of the forgotten lost eighties slasher movie. So we have to change up some of the stuff that you saw in there because, Right. you're expecting it but so then you're like okay well now your closest analog is scream and scream to me was uh you know these last couple have worn out their welcome in this whole meta 
you know, uh, self-aware um, yes. thing that they have going on. Where so like, now we want them unaware. Yeah, because in Thanksgiving, it's like the, the people don't know that they're in a horror movie, <laughs> yes, right? Exactly. It is a, but it's it's it has all the things of a holiday movie, and the you know it's it obviously has like a budget to kind of be like the uh, hocus pocus of Thanksgiving, right? So you you, you know it's definitely going to be like on well, the holiday one, rotation for, lot, yeah. <laughs> you know, um. But I guess the thing that surprised me was there was a lot of characters. You know, and the writing on each one of them was specific enough to make them not just feel like cookie cutter. Here's the jock. Here's the, you know, the preppy girl. Here's the, you know, the high school slut. Here's the whatever. They felt more. Uh, I don't I know they were older character or older actors playing like younger uh, than they are, I think. But as, as they always as are. they always are. But yeah. like they had. Uh, I think a life and a humor to them that made them, and I think that's what Eli Roth has. It's like he has this kind of like uh, wit to him. I mean, whether it's, you know, like college frat boy humor or, you know, however you want to describe it sometimes, but it gives the characters um, like this kind of, uh, uh, I guess, like a, a sense of humor or something. That, so they're not just kind of these stock, they they have personalities. And so then you're actually like kind of like, oh, is so-and-so going to die? And there is like the mystery of who, it's, who it is. And, you know, it's not like terribly hard to figure out, but... Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not terribly hard to figure out. Yeah, but I mean, just as far, I guess the reason it places so high on my list is I sat there and I'm like, I am. I, I do ask that question, Colin, because we're, uh, I remember after you saw this, you texted us, you're like, A plus, love it. It's a slasher that is not encumbered by the sort of the newer influences of, like you said, Scream and everything. It's just like pure. The throwback slasher movie it is what it is. And yeah. That's why you loved it. But it still feels like a contemporary movie so it's like okay. you still can take these classic elements and just do it straight ahead you don't have to elevate the subject matter you know you could just make a slasher movie that's a and i think the thing that he remembers the way that eli roth thinks of slasher movies is i think the way that i think of slasher movies is like when you remember them you remember them being uh a kind of an interactive audience pleasing uh sure. fun time at the movies right sure. you don't remember it being like a very it's super scary you know or so um uh, relentlessly grim that you know you never want to see the thing you know, like oh that was horrifying but, or whatever it's like also you, the experience we have on the show when we're watching slasher movies something like the 70s and 80s yeah mm -hmm. Yes. And so this one nailed it. I think this is the best slasher movie since the My Bloody Valentine 3D. Um, and I love slasher movies. So this was catnip. I was like <laughs> extremely pleased. I'm like, this is, uh, I think, you know, I don't know. I was going to say, is it is it the best movie of Eli Roth's career? Without um, a doubt. Yeah. Oh, so you're just jumping uh, right no, in. No, no, no. I'll, I'll go back to Cat Fever. No, no, no question for me. Oh, see, it's interesting yeah, that, I like that, it better. that you would go to cabin fever, Sean. Like, hostile is a, a concept and an idea, I think, that, that you know, holds more, you know, it like. Maybe, it, I'll, maybe I'll say they're even because the hot and the right. Now they bring in hostile. Like, that's. No, that hit a, that hit a, that hit a level that you're just like, oh, okay. All right, yes. Yeah. You're, Hostel no, 2 right, is actually right. the better movie, but I think Hostel 1 uh, is more... Hostel 1 got there first. Yeah. Uh, but so he's been kind of growing as a filmmaker throughout his career, um, and, uh, you know, now he makes stuff that, you know, you're just like, what is the house with a clock in its walls? Is an Eli <laughs> Roth movie? My you kid know? loved it. Death Wish <laughs> was, a, was a, a, an Eli Roth movie, now he's got the... Yeah, uh, he's got yeah. uh, Borderlands, I think think has been shot and i don't know where it is it's oh, been really? shot like a year uh wow. he did that that's an adaptation of the video game but uh but i think the way that and i always use this analogy that michael bay gave us like armageddon and the rock and bad boys but like the real Damn. like his style 
meshes with Transformers. Like Transformers is the Michael Bay movie, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the way that absolutely. Thanksgiving is the Eli Roth <laughs> movie. Yeah. Uh, I thought so. Yeah, I would recommend it. Uh, they check it out. Uh, horror fans, you're going to be putting it on your yearly rotation. Thanksgiving. Number two. Sean, what's your number two? Okay, Colin, can I... Um... I, I feel like it's only right that we just continue because my number two is also Thanksgiving. Oh, my yeah. number two I, is also Thanksgiving. I feel, like we should just, I feel like we should just get it out of the way. All right, yeah, let's get it all out now. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, talk about it. Talk about it. No. Okay. Mine, is, yeah. mine is definitely not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I agree with you. Thanksgiving is also my number two, and it is based on the viewing experience that I had in the theater. That movie was so much fun. We, we laughed so hard throughout that entire movie and there was audible reactions to i would say 75 percent of that movie had audible reactions just laughing or gasping or just yelling like it, it was a great experience it was it was everything that you want in a slasher movie experience in the theater and i was remarkably impressed because i i was not looking forward to that movie i was like Eli ralph what's he been doing that interests me i don't give a shit yeah exactly and, yeah and michaela you and i would talk about it. we're like eh, i don't give a shit about that and then we only went because colin talked yeah, us into it yeah, yeah. Colin was like, no, really, go see it. And we did. And we were pleasantly surprised. And it was such a fun experience. You know, uh, there was so many, there's so many things about, like, you can pick it apart. You know, I didn't like the main girl. I didn't like a lot of the acting. Obviously, there was so Yes, many, yes, yes. There was some big giveaways. Like, we knew it was coming. But, like, I don't care. It was such a fun movie. It was, it, it was ridiculous. And it was hilarious. And it's over the top and it's you know like you were saying you know it's it's the opposite of they're they're going meta with everything now and it's the opposite of that and that's exactly what i want for my slash movie experience yeah so you know i i colin i think you i think you said it all really well so like let's continue the the discussion on it because man i had yeah. fun with that movie i had a lot of fun with that movie and michaela i'm yeah, I, just a, I just have a little bit more to add, but nothing. Yeah. yeah, I think you guys really nailed it. But yeah, I, I, Colin, I was not going to go see this in theaters because I'm still so upset about the Green Inferno when I saw that in theater. <laughs> and I fucking hated that movie that I'm still mad about it that I was not going to go see this until you talked me into it. But I, um, yeah, I love that it's a pure, sl- pure slasher. Just, and I agree, Colin, those are like, I don't even care if it's the exact same story as the My Bloody Valentine remake. That story fucking works. So keep yeah. making it. I don't care. Care, keep making slashers. I don't care that it's the exact same storyline. I just yeah. want to see it done well. You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just have some fun Thanksgiving pills, and that's what they did. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it 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 was so it's so simple that like it's it shouldn't work but it does you know like yeah and uh best use of a cat in a slasher ever yes, <laughs> yes. and uh, let's not forget that was that was yeah. t- that was tonic the cat from pet cemetery oh, oh, oh. <laughs> he's a genre icon now guys like <laughs> what i i loved because when i saw it I was like oh not only is there a cat but it's like a famous cat so like he's in this for a reason right and i was like oh no something bad for sure is gonna happen to this cat right yeah and Oh, no, nothing bad happens to the cat. It's great. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. He gets fed by the killer. Yeah, yeah the it's killer treats him. Beautiful. It's wonderful. Uh, yeah. My only problem with this movie is me. I am the problem. You I, was, I was too worried about, because uh, I, like I said, I took my kid to it. I was too worried about that whole aspect of it. To proper, I, I think properly enjoy it for what it was, which is why I feel like, like I, it was good enough that I want and need to watch it again. To fully, I think fully enjoy it and look at the aspects of it as to what you guys have described tonight. And mm-hmm. so, I like, I'm, I'm, I want to watch it again, but that is, the, I think, the reason why you guys place it higher than I do. I was worried about a lot more going into it than you guys. Were. You were seeing it through your son's eyes and like, oh, yeah, as a parent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. One, you were was, you were worried about a woman being roasted by a turkey or I was like a turkey. Yeah. No, I was yeah. about the trampoline scene. The roasted. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The trampoline scene. You know, I got to tell you, I was shocked that he. I was shocked that Eli Roth 
pulled back on that compared to the trailer. I too. Yeah. Yeah. It's lesser than the trailer, right? Yeah. 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 It's way, and that's that's what I haven't gone into is kind of like the look of the trailer versus what he pulled off in the movie and everything, which is something I look forward to like getting into. I just didn't get the opportunity right off the bat. So it is. is I agree with you guys. It's just something I want to look more into. You know, uh, <laughs> and haven't had the opportunity to since you know before the end of the year. So. I also I really I really like how Eli Roth um, creates characters that like you just really want to see put through it because they suck so much like Mm -hmm. you know like they're not but not in a cartoonish way but in a way that is believable like I felt like some of these fucking high school kids this movie I was like I went to school with this asshole like you know like they felt very and everyone having Massachusetts accents makes it that much more funny so you know (laughs) that (laughs) yeah but um yeah Sean now that we got all of our number twos out of the way what's your number two my number two is Barbie. Nice. <laughs> and Barbie is an um and because we came into like this whole year. All right, this year, 2023, was the Barbenheimer. It was the dynamic between Barbie and Oppenheimer, and uh, we came out in maybe uh, a way that for me I didn't think I would in that. I really liked Barbie, and I thought Oppenheimer was a disappointment. Really? So, uh, yes, because um, Oppenheimer. Uh, well, all right, forget Oppenheimer. We're talking about Barbie. Yeah, <laughs> Barbie, Barbie did a lot of things that I thought were. Barbie did things that I thought were really fun, really analytical, really funny, really just. Uh, I, I I think if you're gonna make a movie called Barbie, like, it's crazy. There's so much opportunity for what you can do with a movie that is just Barbie. You can go so many ways with it, and I think the way they went with it, because I'm coming off a time where I have uh, Greta Gerwig is coming off of Little Women, a movie which I love, which is mm-hmm. I think a really good movie. Yeah. Um, it, it really was. It was. It was well written, well directed. Really liked that movie. And you know, when you're getting into Little Women, which I think is, uh, I, I I think it's a safe, it's a safe choice of a movie to make. But it's also a movie where you can make and be really great at it, and, and, and to to be safe with it, but really do great things with those expectations. And we're coming off Noah Baumbach with. Um, um, uh, Marriage Story, which is also another movie that I thought was really great. Uh, these things influenced me because, I mean, Marriage Story influenced me because, you know, it came out at a time where, uh, as a man coming off divorce, like, we had to watch a movie where, uh, you, know, you know, a relationship and a couple of splits and how that affects them plus a kid, like, it really felt personal to me. But then we get into Barbie, which is just rife for uh, 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 a character as Barbie, who has been a representation of in the early years of what "quote unquote" a perfect female should be, and that's not my thinking, but what you know, what it was kind of built as, and you know, the history of Barbie coming into this movie and what you can do with that, and the way the movie was made, it is a, it's a thought on. Um, commercialism, it's a thought on a surrealism. I mean, if you get Will Ferrell involved as the, as the executive who's uh, lording over Barbie, like, that adds to a comedy element of it. Um, uh, there's so much in this movie that is so, I think, enjoyable. Because you get to comment, if you're making a movie called Barbie, you get to comment on so much and, and kind of make your perspective known that is so... It can be so entertaining and so funny because they do so much with this. I, I think you have to look at the whole history because uh, Margot Robbie was is the producer of this movie and championed this movie for I think a few years before it actually got made. Um, and I think if you look back at the history, didn't think she, yeah, she herself wasn't the um, the person to play Barbie. I think she had a few other people in mind before her to do it. But if you look at the, the history of that um, and what it came to be, it, it, it's such a... I think it's such a good story for... 
I think for everybody, and you know, you can look at this. It, it is definitely a feminist story, I think, obviously. But I think that for everyone to look at it, you, you benefit from it. But just there's so, there's so much good stuff in this. It's so funny. It's very well written because it's written by uh, Greta Gerwig, who directed the movie as well, and Noel Baumbach, her uh, husband, who also co-wrote it. Um, but their perspectives on this leads to so many fun opportunities. Uh, story-wise, and that's not even talking about the actors who were cast in it. We got Margot Robbie as Barbie. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Is Ken? Um, Ryan Gosling. Gosling is Ken. Like uh, just spectacular, <laughs> spectacular. Him is Ken. The the the. It, it's a musical as well. The he gets a, he gets a whole song about being Ken and you know being uh, Ken off. Or, uh, camp, mm-hmm. uh, like it, just, there, there's so much cultural swirl around this movie that I think I think you can get a lot out of it, no matter who you are, what perspective you're coming from. Uh, there's so much that you can read into it, so much that's built into it, so much comedy that's built in it, and I think that's the thing that gets us across the finish line is that he's very funny. Uh, Michael Sarah is in this movie. He plays a character called Alan. I think mm-hmm. his character is also extremely funny in, in his journey to this movie. Ken is also... You realize the ridiculous ridiculousness of Ken as a character and, and what he feels... <laughs> <laughs> for the patriarchy, what he thinks it is, and when he realizes it doesn't involve horses, he's really out. <laughs> but, but there's so many, uh, so many funny aspects of this movie about what the characters want, or what they want, what they end up getting, and what they realize is what's best for them. It, it, it's it's a very complex movie, and it's a very funny movie, and it's got something to say. But it but it's also a movie that can say a lot, but also be ridiculous in a way that is um, uh, uh, dismissive as you know as just comedy. Um, it, it, it's a complex movie that I think does a lot, and I love that it does a lot. And it'll affect you on many different levels. Um, I love the filmmakers that came into it. I love what they did. I love what they wrote. I love what they accomplished. Um, and uh, I love what the actors did for it. Um, I, I, cause it's very funny and very enjoyable. Uh, it, and the ending joke of the movie, it really, it, it just like, yeah, you know, from where, you know, it, it really is. I thought it was really, really was from where you go from this character to where they end up in that final joke. I think it's just perfect because that is like, if you, I, uh, uh, not to say that I'm uh, understanding anything better than anybody else, but if you get where they're coming from in that ending moment, it feels perfect in the arc of it for that character, and I love that that they do that and that they were able to accomplish that and get to it, and it really is just it's a it's a great journey for that character. I loved watching them do it. I love the side characters doing it. I love that Barbie got where she needed to be able to Ken uh, figured something out in his life and all the other Kens um, and you know musical sequences as long as they're you know accomplish something they really hit home like it, it's just a really good movie I think that it, it just I uh, had fun with it you can have fun like the messaging I've seen I've seen a lot of the messaging in this movie before and once you've seen that a lot you kind of just like okay I know I get it, and know where that's going, and that, yeah, that can be like maybe it can be repetitive, and then maybe the uh, the most I can say about um, uh, as a negative for this movie, but it's just really enjoyable, really fun, really well written, uh, directed, and I liked really what they did with this movie. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Like Barbie, it's good. Like it's just good. I liked it. So Barbie, number two for me. I like Barbie. It did good. Well, in in I was like in the in the spirit of of the the theme here of me jumping in and saying, well, I picked it too. I'm gonna say my number one is Barbie. Barbie. So I'm gonna go. Now. <laughs> my number one is also Barbie. Yes. Well, let's just talk about it. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Just really good. Yeah. I, I loved Barbie so much. I think we were, you know, I think as a collective uh, society, we were excited about Barbie for so many reasons. One of them being like, it, she is the most iconic figure in in boy history for sure. Um, yeah, she, yeah. It, it's she like was, American history. Right? Yeah, she was a she was a picture that we all grew up with. You know, I, I it was my favorite toy growing up. I played with Barbies constantly. So just the iconicness that is Barbie was already exciting. And then to put Greta Gerwig behind it and make it into what it was is just astonishingly good. It was such a beautiful movie, like literally beautiful because everything is gorgeous and pink and perfect. Yes, and they even I love it. Of just like they showing like the, yeah, the style, like, the, like the new, the new fashion style of Barbie. There was literally, yeah, there was literally like a shortage of pink paint because of this movie and it's just <laughs> wonderful. Like, right. Yeah. And the, 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 like the, the scenes, like you said, you know, showing like the fashion, like, the different the different fashions throughout time and stuff and yeah it, it was just so wonderful to see like our childhoods flashed up on the screen like from people like my mom's age like they they played with barbies and then like through girls today it's just it's a toy that's transcends right. all generations like, like i play yeah. with barbies like, yeah at a certain point you're, yeah. in, a, you're in a toy room like, yes. you, like, I was in my babysitters. You're in a toy room. What do you have to play with? Everything is in toy room. And what's in that toy room? Barbies. And yeah. you play with them. And that is part of what your upbringing is. Yeah, I had a, I have an older brother, so we played G.I. Joe's and Barbie. Like, it was just went hand and Hot Wheels. It went hand in hand. We just did it all. Yep. But... But it's just the, the iconography is so great, and what I love the most is that the movie has a very difficult subject matter to tackle, and they needed that icon to get the message across. Yes. Right? Like it is, it is a feminist movie, but it's a, it's not just a feminist movie. It is about an equality movie. It is about so much. It's about how toxic the patriarchy can be. It's about you know toxic masculinity. It is, even, it, even know, if the patriarchy is about horses and not about horses. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's such a difficult subject matter and the only way to tackle it was the way that Greta Gerwig did with this icon that we all know and love with humor with music with all of these different facets that made the message really hit home for everybody and it was such a moving movie I cried several times watching this movie and I saw it in the theater like three times but I <laughs> cried several times the the moment when America Ferrera gives the speech about how hard it is to be a woman yeah I bawled my eyes out Michaela was with me I bawled my eyes out I was so it touched me so much because that is exactly what we all feel and to have them say that on a big screen for the biggest movie of the year, so the entire right. world biggest. can Everyone see it. Everyone gets to see it. Yeah, every it. single person gets to hear what we all struggle with. Like, it just moved me so much. And the fact that, like, the message throughout was that we are Barbie. We are all Barbie. Right. You know, right. they're, they're, even they're, we're, we're, we're different they're, ones. Right. They're, yeah. They're everyone, like, hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. We all are yeah. Barbie. Because we're not, because we're different Barbies, but we're the same Barbie. And like yeah. that, like as far as a perspective of women and humans, like just in general, we have these different personalities in ourselves. We have these different versions of us, but we're still the same person. We're still the same like unit in humanity. Like we're all individuals, but we're all we all have these shared experiences and these shared thoughts and. To have that portrayed the way Greta Gerwig did was just so beautiful and so touching, and it it was just perfect. Like, that movie, it made me laugh, it made me cry, it was just everything I wanted it to be and more. It was just amazing, and I could just keep saying that over and over again. Uh, Michaela, go ahead and jump in with your thoughts, and we can keep this conversation going. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I don't even try to add to what you guys said because you, you really hit on it. And I feel like the better a movie is, the less I usually have to say about it, right? I feel yeah. like by the time I get to my number one, I'm just like, it's good. Just, you know, right. like, yeah. it's, it's right. undeniably good. I can't, 
express that more, watch it. Right. But, like, when we loop back around to our worst of, that's when I'll have the most to say, you know? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. but, you know. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I, I, I gotta say, I it, it's a movie that actively made me feel good about being a woman, and I don't know that I've ever had another movie make me feel that way, ever. Yeah. Um, uh, that being said, like, I, I just, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, it's not only about feminism and the struggles of being a woman, but it's also about uh, existential dread yes. and anxiety and depression. And the, the depression stuff really worked for me, and I love mm-hmm. that aspect of it, too. Um, I also like that it, like, head-on kind of confronts literally in, like, an argument, like, all the problems with Barbie as well. Like, Yes! Um, it, it confronts the commercialism and yeah. what, she, what, she, uh, you know, what she may represent, but it's not her intention. Like, right. Yes. Because I was, I was going to be really uncomfortable with this movie if they pretended like there was never, ever a problem with mm-hmm. Barbie's existence. Yeah. Yeah. It, then it would have just been like a propaganda commercial for Mattel, right? Like, they yeah. could not do that, you know? Um, but they they did it, and, like, they did it in a very literal way, but, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, got the point across. Dumb people see movies, too, you know? Sometimes <laughs> things can be, you know, straightforward. But, um, yeah, I loved it. Everyone was committed to the bit. The production design is gorgeous. Is movie, it, I, my only concern, the only thing I negative I could say is I just worry the wrong message will be taken away from this. Mm-hmm. And instead of getting more movies for, about, and by women, we will get more toy movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And that is not, that's not the, the mess. That's not what studios should be taking away. The answer is not to make a magic eight ball movie and a fucking, uh, <laughs> I don't know, fucking mousetrap movie. American girl. No, 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 American no, girl no, directed no. by a woman. Not a Magic Air Ball movie that we don't write. Yeah, we we wrote one. one. We wrote a fucking great Magic Air Ball movie in our so, group chat. If uh, you want that, come to us because we have right, that. So, <laughs> yeah. Locked because and then, then, then what you could at least say it was written by a couple of women, right? So like it's got that. Okay, so there you exactly. go. Um, but yeah, uh, I Barbie was my number one, and it, it it had a lot of hype to live up to. Like the it hype really, train could not yes. have been more intense for this really movie. Did. And Oppenheimer, they the yep. Barbenheimer that was mm-hmm. half of our year. It was like six months of us talking about. Hey, it's it crazy. Like, These two yeah, movies are coming out the same day. Yep. Yeah. Um, what a time to be alive. But yeah, that was my number one. So. Colin, what is your number one? Yep. All right, so it's gonna be Colin and then me, and then I think the conversation is gonna end. Well, then we go <laughs> into our worst of worst of. Yeah. Movie. Yes. Yes. All right. So, best movie of the year, and again, we're talking about the stuff that we've seen. I didn't see Barbie, uh, so I I can't watch share Barbie, in that one. Colin. Huh? <laughs> watch Barbie. You gotta watch Barbie. Well, there's so many things I guess that I haven't seen, so you know I'm probably excluding a great many movies here. But for me, the far and away best thing that I saw this movie, it was the most movie movie that I saw this year. I got, I don't know, there was uh, there was drama, there was comedy, there were thrills, action, adventure, Indiana Jones movie. It was I was I was overwhelmed by this movie and it was Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Um, yeah, I mean I I was unprepared for this. I don't know. I saw Into the Spider-Verse I and it. I liked it quite a bit, but Across the Spider-Verse was the most creative I mean, just, I mean, a kaleidoscope of because I guess it's the idea that Miles Morales, right, is trying to there's that coming of age thing with the romance with spider Gwen. He's got his parents in high school to deal with. They introduce this character called the spot, which is the, I love the, the spot. The spot is like the most horrifying. Like I was like, Oh my God, the implications of this thing was like, because it starts off. It was like, okay, you can throw little portals all over the place, but, no, it's earth shaking, <laughs> but by the end of it, you're like, Oh my God. Like I cannot see how you would even deal with this. This is the thing that like blinks reality out of existence, yeah. you know, but that's not even, that's like 
the B plot uh, because he <laughs> has to do an emotional family story point that is going to the first film, this film, and probably the next film. Yeah, well, I was I was also unprepared for the fact that this was part of a uh, you know I thought it was going to end. Um, I did too, Colin. And I the I was, the fact I was like, that it oh my God, it's not ending. the the fact that it didn't kind of I was like disappointed and shocked yes. actually. Yes. I don't know, like when it came up yes. with to be continued, I'm like what, and I kind of felt no, a right. little bit ripped off. Yes, um, I agree. But the whole idea is kind of, and I know I railed against uh, meta textual uh, uh, information in, in, in horror movies, right? I think it's been played out. Scream planted the flag and, and did it. But this is like this meta version of Spider-Man where we're able to see like, you know, there's this rift in the, the you're tired of hearing about metaverses, but it allows you to kind of, it actually makes a comment on itself and about like Miles Morales himself and where he fits in with like all these other Peter Parkers. And that's actually kind of one of the things I like about it because I'm generally not like a fan of Hollywood just kind of casting a black or Hispanic actor or a woman in, in a traditional role that was like, you know, Little Mermaid or something. Right. Um, but Miles Morales is his own character. This is a guy who has a backstory a history, a, a family and cultural dynamic in New York where he lives. He's different yep. than Peter Parker. They make a, you know, like the whole movie basically becomes about that subject itself. It's like he's very compelling, and you're, you know, he. Yeah. And they make it about that, and then they're like, "What if this wasn't supposed to happen?" Yeah, and I think that's also the thing that you kind of get from, you know, I, I suppose maybe Spider Man whether it's Peter Parker or Miles Morales, always has that. He's like the underdog kind of. Maybe of, the greatest superhero we've got. Yeah, because you, you root for the guy to pull through because it seems like in a lot of times he's not entirely equipped for the job i think because of always like he of his youth you know so miles morales shares that with uh peter parker but I, there was just like the 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 family dynamic i'm sitting there going like this is better written than yes. most of the live action dramas that yes. i see and then there's this whole thing about like uh um i guess there are other spider men and women from right, the, the alternate dimer- dimensions yeah. that are like policing this kind of thing. And uh, they're led by Oscar Isaac, right? Yeah. And yeah. Daniel Kalua has like this great, he's spider punk. He like steals every scene that he's in. Uh, I, it, there's just like, there's so much going on. I guess yeah. I was, it kind of, it did. It, it, I was overwhelmed by it, both in the complexity of its story and the depth of its characters, the uh, creativity on display with its, um, you know, wide array of art, art styles, you know, because it yes. changes. It actually it like, just, yeah, a lot throughout the different stories we get into. And it's beautiful for each one. And it works uh, the live action. Action Spider-Man into its canon. <laughs> yeah. Which was just kind of like, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, we saw um, No Way Home. Was it No Way Home? No Way Home, yeah. yeah which kind of did that. You know, that was exciting. That was like, you know, one of the last exciting superhero movies, I think, yeah. that I ever saw. And this kind of kept on going with that theme and incorporated them into into the Spider-Verse. I don't know. I was, uh, I was, I was, floored i just i i can't speak the the virtues of this movie enough that you have to see it i mean just for it's um you know creative storytelling and the weight of its drama um it was just uh yeah it, it was it was a ride i mean i got i got a movie out of oh, spider-man yes. across the spider-verse <laughs> and i think and I yeah can't, i can't yeah i can't wait for that next I was very um, like like you said. I was like, what is and what? Where the story's not done. We got so much more to go. Like there is, I, I feel there is. I feel like there is so much more that they're gonna get to in the conclusion of this coming up this year. I think, but yeah. Yeah. Good good stuff. Yeah. It was um I mean I think, you know, maybe that was the problem that I had with the the first one. It was like, well, it's a cartoon, you know, and somehow 
in my mind going into it, it's like, well, this is like a side project or the lesser of the, you know, your the live action Tom Holland movies are your, you know, they tie into the Avengers and they're like a flagship right. kind of thing. But this is in many ways superior to any of the other Spider-Man movie, uh, Spider-Man movies that I've seen. Uh, and that's uh, a high bar, you know, it's set by like <laughs> Spider-Man two or, you know, or no way home. You know, it's just the, uh, it yep. was, it was impressed. I was impressed by this movie quite a bit. So that would be yep. nine, my number one. I guess that ends us with Sean's number one. Here comes Oppenheimer, the best no. movie of the year. We've been told. Didn't make anybody's list. Though. I know. I, I make, no. So should we talk about the fact that Oppenheimer didn't yeah, make sure. any of our lists? You know what? It it was very close to being on my list. It was like even like number two slot. I was very tempted to to talk about. I it. did have it as a runner up, but it I was. Think, on, yeah, yeah. I, I think that is the movie. I think it is the close call runner up for a lot of people because it wasn't. It didn't hit me. I, I I don't think I don't think the emotion was there in in ways it was for prior. Uh, um, movies from him, and that, and that's why it, it didn't quite hit for me. I was a little disappointed in it. I, I, I really I liked where it went and everything, but I think it's missing some certain emotions that would have like, really nailed it for me. But that's that's. My yeah, I, still, I still got the emotional aspect. I still got the emotional aspect. I I really I did really enjoy it a lot actually. Um, this, and it's really good it, stuff. It, it did impact me a lot, and honestly, like even though it was crazy long i i still i thought it went by pretty quick like i it yeah. had my attention the whole time yeah, yeah, it it yeah. yeah, I, yeah. it's one of those movies that you respect yeah. um, <laughs> Maybe more than you're like, uh, you know, I got to see that movie again. It was so great. And some of you no. may love it, but it's it to me, it, it's closest analog was Oliver Stone's JFK, where it feels like this yeah. subject is so massive. What he's trying, yeah. Christopher Nolan's trying to cover that just building the movie from a movie making standpoint seems like he had to, it was like building a skyscraper, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like, like holy like cow, I put that thing together. like this should be a Ken Burns documentary. Yeah. With multiple parts at a certain point. Yeah, like, yeah. and the fact that you can was, follow yeah. it, you know, I mean, is a testament to his skill at, at Ken I think it. the movie itself is basically the Manhattan Project number two. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Seriously. But yeah, I did like Oppenheimer. For the record, it was very close to being on my list. Yes. <laughs> Uh, what do we have? Me for number one? Oh, yes. It's going to be disappointing. My number one was Talk to Me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. I really thought this was uh, 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 head and shoulders above a lot of horror movies we got this year, a lot of movies we got this year. I was really into it. I, I, I really liked the intensity of it, the story of it. Um, I really liked how I think it tapped into the younger generation in a way that sort of felt natural. Again, we talked about the story with like, this would be the new TikTok trend that you may not believe if you saw it on TikTok. Because I think there's a lot of things that you see on social media. You're like, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't believe that. Uh, like, you, you, know, you can do anything on social media. Um, this is another thing. And this would be one of those things, one of those trends that pops up and it's like, Oh, it's very interesting. Uh, I like that if someone was setting this up to be something that is fake, I like what they do with it and, you know, how it goes. But the fact that it, it is portrayed as something uh, in, in reality that is happening, um, and the story is... Um, it, it's scary to me that you can... It's scary and exciting that you can get into this sort of thing, like that it is a party trick or, or a perla game or even a, a drug that you can get addicted to, as some of these characters do. And the fact that, that the quote-unquote older characters who are like two years older than some of the other ca younger characters in this movie, that they get into and that they experience and they get out of, and then you get that that younger character that tags along that gets into it and then it leads into some other stuff that is dark and disturbing and some of the violence that you get into uh, that happens to these characters and where does it go from there and kind of the um, 
kind of the darkness you get into and what you need to explore as far as a character. And like we talked about earlier, how um, the whole dynamic of um, a, a family consisting of a dad and mom who have lost their, their mother and what they have to deal with and what they don't deal with is in regards to each other and what they turn to when they can't get that from each other, what they will turn to to, to, to find some solace and what these characters do turn to and when they run into what they think is something that will satiate the pain that they are feeling and this is me trying to talk about this movie without giving a little spoilers but <laughs> and when what they find and and what they will continue to pursue in order to not feel the pain of loss and 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 in pursuing that the trouble they get into and the trouble they get people they love into and to try and save them and where they end up. There, it's a complexity of dealing with loss and and what you do with that and what you'll try and do to save others from feeling that or what you'll do to save others from uh, uh, being in pain or also losing them. Um, I think it's a very complex story. I think it's a very scary story. I, I, I like the ending may be something uh, that you may have seen before or be familiar with, but I really like how the story progressed and what they ended with and the, the ending of the story and where the main character ends up. I was just like, that's where the main character needed to end. And when they got there and it was revealed, I was just like, uh, I love it. I, I love where they went. Um, there's a lot of this story to like and to be horrified by. And even like they don't go too far into it, they give you glimpses of they give you glimpses of how far characters who have been possessed get taken to, and what they're surrounded by, and what they're being uh, plagued by when you can't see them. There's a lot of there's a lot to the story, and it really made me think, and it really made me enjoy um, being with these characters and horrified with being with these characters and what they were going through. I think talk to me is really one of the uh, it's the, the the best horror movie of this year. It's, it's one of the best horror movies I've seen in, the, in a few years. Um, I really liked it. I would I, if the filmmakers because the sequel has been announced. If the filmmakers can figure out a really good way to go with this story, I'm all for it. I'm in for it. Um, talk to me. One of the greatest, one of the best movies of this year. I really liked it. Um, can't wait to watch it again. Um, I haven't, I haven't watched it with the, uh, uh, the commentaries from the filmmakers and everything. I, 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 I look forward to a deep dive into this, but I think it's an experience you can get watching this movie that is really will really grab you and shake you and hold you. And uh, I, I think it's really good. So talk to me, my number one for twenty twenty three. Hi. Yeah. I mean, it's really good. I really liked it. It, was, it really got me. I like yeah. that, that, and that that ending. I think is a very that ending. Maybe feels like really. Are you afraid of the dark ending? But I think it was <laughs> what the movie. It does. It does. But I think it was. But it works for the movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really it's, like that. It works for the movie. It's a movie that follows its convictions. You know, I, yeah, yeah. from a narrative perspective i think yes, that was it really goes with it and it's like yeah. this is what we're doing and it does it but it does it well but mm -hmm. i really liked it so yeah talk to me is when i'm on for the year well, um, that, was, that was another that was another one that it was it was definitely on my list but i knew other people would talk about it yeah. so i'm like i'm gonna put something else on there but well, it was up there for me yes. yeah well that's right, uh cool. i mean looking because i was writing them down as you were saying it but it's uh talk to me thanksgiving and barbie got the most uh you know that those was, those are the three that were on uh, the most list. So oh, that's the holy trifecta of twenty twenty three. Yeah, forget Barbenheimer. This is the real setup here. Yeah, the son of the Holy Ghost. Yep. Yeah. Barben horror. <laughs> well, now we come to the most anticipated part of uh, tonight's yeah. show, which is when we get to unleash our hatred. Oh, yeah, we, did, we did everything, didn't we? Yeah, we got your number. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah, you're right. All yep. right so. so now we unleash oh. our hatred on just, just one movie apiece. Oh, not not five. Yeah. We're just going to unleash oh, hatred yeah. on one, well, one movie. The that's worst. the hardest part, is there's so really many is. that deserve it. There's so many that deserve it. But, Colin, 
what is the one movie that you would like to unleash your hatred on? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna work my way up because I saw oh, a bunch of bad oh. movies this year that I would warn you away from. So you're doing the thing we just said yep. that you shouldn't do. Okay. I would warn you away from the last voyage of the Demeter. <laughs> I would warn you away from Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantumania. But that was not even as bad as one of the worst movies of the year, which was Cocaine Bear. But, <laughs> but, but this, the, this is on my list of not good movies for the No, yeah. these are the these are bad movies. But bad movie. bad, but bad there's movie. one there's bad one bad that movie. takes the cake as the absolute worst movie of the year. And I think the reason was because yeah, you can say Cocaine Bear is a terrible, terrible fucking movie. But there's one movie that I hated uh, because I was offended by the movie. And that is of course David Gordon Green's The Exorcist Believer. The worst oh, I can't wait for this. The worst movie of the year. So let me ask you a question. First of all, am I the only one who fell on this sword? Yeah. Yeah, yeah because we all knew what we were gonna get into, Colin. <laughs> And uh, we knew somebody, and when we're actually somebody, we knew you. We knew you. We were <laughs> yeah. to explore this territory, and so we waited for your feedback from it. Well, so, yeah. I like the way that you're saying, like, yeah, we knew it was going to be bad. But the reason that you knew it was going to be bad was because it was from David Gordon Green, because he exactly. had notoriously made three of the worst Halloween. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we covered uh, all three of them. All three. All, All three, three of them. Not, not, uh, not and the trailer. I, I'll disagree. Not three of the worst. Well, we covered all three of the, of the Halloween movies, so you can go back and listen to full episodes on those. But we did. Um, the reason that you were expecting Exorcist Believer to be so bad is because basically David Gordon Green and Danny McBride is co screenwriter. Uh, the, the and he co wrote at least the story for this one. Did he? Yeah, he's credited uh, in there somewhere. He he helped. the The reason is is because these two guys. Gordon Green specifically, who apparently was a... I haven't seen any of his dramas. I've only seen his comedies. And then you go like, well, this is the guy who may, who showed up to direct these Halloween movies. The wrong sensibility. He is just trying to shit all over uh, horrors, uh, you know, sacred cows, right? Because you go like... One after the other. You go, what is, what, are, what is the thinking here? It's like, we have to do something new, you know? But we have to give the audience something that they want, or at least get them in the door, and then we're going to expose them to new ideas within this uh, established franchise. There are four Exorcist movies, five, I think, if you count the Paul Schrader original version of the Rennie Harlan number four, right? You can get both of those. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, but each one of those is like, okay, well, some of those are bad. Some of those are galactically bad. The Exorcist 2 is galactically bad. Um, but it always feels like it's a disappointment or they missed the mark. You know, they were aiming somewhere and it's like, what in the fuck are you doing? And then they, they missed it. This one feels like they're deliberately trying to shit on you. And the reason I say this is because... <laughs> Exorcism is a Latin word that is, correct me if I'm wrong, exclusive to the Catholic faith, right? Oh, In oh, which bad. case, then you would assume that a movie about exorcism would be like, well, we got to get those Catholics uh, back up again because they're the only ones who have exorcism. But no, this, well, well, the climax, are there, other, are there other words that mean to, to force a demon out of a, yeah, uh, you know, exactly. I don't even know, but the Catholics have a ritual for it. And maybe you do in Santeria or voodoo. Yeah, I don't think you but do in like Baptist, about. you know, uh, 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 <laughs> Protestant, you know, or I don't think, uh, so, but basically the, the climax of the movie has to gather because, you know, we live in a secular society now where Catholicism is so passe, right? Yeah. So we're going to make an exorcism movie that involves, I think a witch doctor, a Baptist priest or Baptist uh, minister, sorry, uh, yeah. a former nun, and it's just like we have to get everybody together so they can chant evil dies tonight. Evil <laughs> dies tonight. I mean, it literally builds up to literally, that. Yeah, you could bring it over to this movie, yes. Colin, I have a question. If I'm making a trilogy, why is this not the story, the third story in the trilogy? 
Shouldn't that be everyone you uniting together? Shouldn't it all be leading to this moment? Right. We need the Avengers of Exorcist. Yeah, that's what they basically movie. tried to do, right? The Exorcist. Yeah, the why Avengers. are we doing this in the first movie of three? All right. They literally have a scene that takes place in a church where all of these, like the four, I think, like uh, Avenger uh, type persons line up. You know, they all come in from off camera and get in a line and then start walking toward the camera. Like wow. that actually happens in this movie they um, get the hero landing huh yes <laughs> um they pre-sold it as a trilogy so we have to have three of yeah, these movies this there, one was yeah. so goddamn offensive and i think it universally hated by everyone who saw it the other thing i think that is the problem with this movie and i i do want to try and avoid spoilers i guess just out of common decency <laughs> you know but um, they bring back Ellen Bernstein because they brought back Jamie Lee Curtis, right? Yep. The big deal with Blumhouse, who produced it, is like we're gonna get the original, uh, you know, heroine from the original movie and bring her back, right, to face off against the evil once again. But I don't know whose fucking idea was to treat her the way that they treat her in this movie. Oh, she also has to have a line about the patriarchy, right? The Catholic. That's why she wasn't in the room uh, when they were exercising Regan was because, I don't know, the patriarchy. And you're like, maybe because you're not a Catholic priest. You know, it's like, maybe that's how this actually works. Um so the story is about like yeah. uh, a father who um, him and his he has a daughter and then there's a, another couple. He's lost his wife it's a in black Haiti. Family and a white family. Yeah, it's Leslie That's Odom Jr. Is he? Wait, um, did someone lose a parent in this movie? Uh, yes. <laughs> Does he? Yeah. In, in an opening scene that is unrelated to the rest of the movie, I'm convinced. I cannot find a thematic thread to the opening of the movie and the rest of it. But anyway, so there's two girls, and they go missing, and then they reappear, and then they start acting weird. And then we have to expose them to the sci scientific tests and the doctors and all that. And we're like, oh, because this is an exorcist movie, that's how it goes. And that's about as far as, like, once it starts clocking into that, you know, like, okay, we're in an exorcist movie, then we have to go and somebody says there's a woman named Re uh, Chris McNeil, and she wrote a book. The whole idea of her character in this movie uh, uh, runs contrary to who she was, right? In the original movie, you're like, well, you know, it's been 50 years or whatever. But right. it's just like, this is not the same. She has the same name, and it's the same actress. But, like, Chris McNeil would not be, like, publicizing her daughter's, uh, you know, experience by becoming a best-selling author. Like that wasn't, that wasn't who she was. Right? And, right. and they forget that she was an actor. I don't know. I was very upset and offended by this. Um, but it just seems like every creative decision that they make is either leaning heavily on shit you've already seen because this is what an exorcism movie is. But the problem, I think the problem with exorcist movies, right? And I'm saying in general, not with the brand name. Right. Um, is that that idea, somebody becomes possessed, usually a child, right? And a holy man forces that demon out is always about the holy man, right? It's about the conflict uh, of like, you know, somebody who's losing or has lost their faith coming into contact with a legitimate supernatural entity and kind right. of having to, that's the story of the exorcist. This one doesn't do it at all. Like it just says like, you know, Catholic, pre uh, whatever, you know, it's like <laughs> you, you lose that whole thing. I think the the father's like an atheist or doesn't really care, you know? And it's just like, well, what's the fucking point of this movie? Like, that's what it is. And the exorcist, the original one did it. And basically like, that's the Mount Everest of exorcist movies. And you've had successful ones every once in a while you have, I like the exorcism of Emily Rose. Uh, mm -hmm. I, cause that was like a courtroom drama. Drama, right? Yeah, right. yeah. It was last as if, exorcism. And the last exorcism. I, uh, mm -hmm. Those are the two that immediately spring to mind. Where you go, like, okay, this is a new way of doing uh, basically the same story. But are I mean, there any exorcism <laughs> movies that we love that don't have exorcism in the title? 
A Day of Exorcism? That don't have exorcism in the title. Yeah, right. I watched it this year. The Pope's Exorcist. No, they don't have. They don't have it in the title. Use the exorcism. Oh, there you go. Exorcist in the title, Holly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we can all ride mopeds to an exorcism. But the the original movie did it so well that you can't. It's not like Halloween where you take like Michael Myers and have him, you know, uh, come back and do other stuff, uh, or Jason, where you can just put him in right. different movies. It's a very specific story, yeah. and I think that's why there's so much trouble in trying to make a, an ex a movie about exorcism that doesn't tread over ground that was covered in 1973 <laughs> and uh, yeah, right. these are like fool's errands that are completely a cash grab uh, you know how can we mine a subject that people are familiar with and they might come back and see we don't have to we can you know disavow the sequels <sighs> <sighs> I hated it. I hated it. It's the worst, the worst movie of the year. I mean, it's so bad. And audiences also, I think, rejected it so much so that there was all this publicity about like, well, Universal paid like $400 million for the rights itself. So they are committed. They have to find a way to exploit this and get a return. They have to make two more movies, but I mean, I'm like, you gotta, you gotta shit can this one and just do something else. And my challenge to you is, or my warning is, there's nothing else that you can do. I, I <laughs> prove me wrong five years from now or whatever, but I'm well, like, it's a fool's errand. <laughs> you, you lose. <laughs> Colin, I like how this movie did the thing I hate in monster movies, where instead of there being one monster, there's two. The extra, two this was girls. like, there's two girls that are possessed. <laughs> <laughs> it's pointless. It doesn't add anything. Stupid. You know, yeah. it, when it when it first starts, it's like okay, the idea. I guess that two girls go off in the woods and disappear, and then come back. You know, it has like a true crime vibe, and yeah. that part of the movie is the best part of the movie. But I'm not saying by much. But it's like at least it's intriguing and it's starting to set up some. But as soon as they show up, it's like we know what happened to them. You know, I mean, it's a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. There's no mystery. You're just waiting for her to start going. You know, your mother sucks cocks in hell or whatever the fuck. You know, right. that she's gonna like, do. I know you. I yeah. saw you fifty years ago. That happens. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> worst movie yep. of the year, Sean. What's the worst movie of the year? Okay, so here we go. Strap in. Um. We're, uh, uh, it's a tie. No, it's not a, not a big tie. Um, we're going to talk about one movie briefly, and then we'll move on. Um, Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> the movie that is the most lucrative movie for Blumhouse ever, I think? Yeah. Five Nights at Freddy's. Horrible movie. <laughs> Don't like it. I watched it with the kid. I lied to him and said it was all right. It's <laughs> really, it's not good. It's not this, the, not, just in, like, there is, and there is a whole backstory folklore about the Five Nights at Freddy's thing. I won't explain it here because it's weird. It's very weird. And it, it's something I don't think a general audience will understand. It's mostly game oriented and the story within that. Um, I sat down and went through it with the kid in an afternoon about all of the games and the story and otherwise. It's not good. It makes sense in short term video games. It does not transfer to a hour and 40 minute movie. It comes across as, as, as bad for everyone involved in it. Mostly the actors, um, it's not good. I don't recommend you watch it. I don't. It's weird to see the power of an IP uh, uh, gain so much money for a corporation because it's just, it's bad and it makes no sense. So Five Nights at Freddy's, ignore that, push it to the John, side. real quick, why did you lie to the kid that it wasn't that bad? <laughs> Did he like it? You don't because when you have a kid, you don't want to destroy their uh, thoughts on things right off the bat. Wait, did he like it? I don't know. I don't think he thought it was great. I don't think he thought it was like one of the. He'll never watch it again. Um, he was interested in it because he had played some of the games and knew of the backstory, and I think the interest was in the backstory. 
and how it came forth in the movies, but I don't think he would have... I don't think he would remember a thing about the movie technically. But did you wa- did you watch it alone before you watched it with him? No, I just watched it with him. I still don't follow why you lied. <laughs> because you don't want to lie. You just uh, I'm very honest with my kid about the movies that I like and dislike. When he wants to watch a movie specifically, I don't want to watch it and then destroy it right in front of him. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because yeah. I'm very, I'm very, okay. If you have, I'm very critical about movies, and I'm pretty open. About you them. are <laughs> right, but, I'm, but I think I'm very open about like, no, I don't like that movie, especially with me and the kid. I'm just like, no, I don't like that movie, and I'll tell you, okay, like, no, I don't. Like that, that makes movie. sense. Yeah. Right, I'm very okay. open with him, and I'm very, I'm a very critical person. I think, and I didn't want to. Like, if he has an inkling, I don't want to destroy every movie he likes, and I do kind of be like that movie sucked. <laughs> for, 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 I'm, I'm pretty honest with the kid, and this one he had some interest in, and I didn't want to be harsh on it, so I <laughs> wasn't very truthful okay. about how I felt with it afterwards. But it's yeah, not, it, it's not but even yeah. the worst movie of the year. No, no, no. If he asked me now, I'd be like, yeah, that wasn't a good movie. And I think as he progresses as a child, he's still 12, he would understand that, yeah, it wasn't good, and we could talk yeah. about it and explain it. But at the moment, I was just like, oh, uh, yeah, I was fine. And which yeah, is what I okay. Said, so. I get but it. The one I had, um, I mean, it's maybe not the worst, but it's the one I had uh, the most friction with as far as what everybody else thought about it. Uh, no one will save you. The alien movie with uh, yeah. with 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 the Debra's woman, who I think is a good actress. And I've seen her in things that I really like, and I think she's good in those. But this is the alien invasion movie that, as a person who, at a certain point, really likes alien invasion movies, did not like this movie. Mm -hmm. In, In a world where everyone was really all for it and everything, I didn't understand the hype for it. I didn't understand... Story-wise, the execution. It is a movie that is made as a as a, a dialogue-free movie, which unless unless you're writing a story that will naturally uh, come upon that where nobody needs to speak, I will understand that. This is not a movie that naturally would have these people not talk to each other. It's an mm-hmm. alien invasion movie. If aliens were invading Earth, there's nothing I would want to talk about more to other people than the aliens coming to this planet <laughs> and abducting people and doing probes to them than this movie. I, I, I don't... Yeah, we saw it done well in a quiet place. I've seen it done well in certain aspects for a bunch of things, but I saw this movie as soon as it came out. I was just like, okay, um, I like I, I, I like alien movies. I like when they invade, and it's kind of a uh, it's the backdoor movie. It's not a whole world. Um, it's not an Independence Day, big spaceships, everyone coming in, and everyone knows about it. It's more of a behind the scenes, like we're going to invade this small area. Well, with certain people will know about it, and they expand from there, and and maybe the story gets bigger and more interesting from there. But it's about a woman who's alone, who's experienced things prior to this movie, who is alone in her house. Um, Holly, I just look at this as you, because this feels like, <laughs> as far as like who the character is, uh, what she likes as far as design and, and yeah. her life, this feels like... A, because she has a cute little house and raised little flower dresses. Right, and she yeah. designs things, she creates things. <laughs> yeah. Like, it it's feels me. like this would be you <laughs> yeah. in the best way. This feels like it would be you. If, aside from murdering my friend. <laughs> and aside from that, which is when we get into the story, the murder of the friend, <laughs> and how that reflects on how the aliens feel about that, but it, it, it's a story of, of that, a, a person, this is a trauma movie, this is a person who has experienced trauma, continues to experience trauma, and then kind of how, uh, 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 as alien beings come in, experience the trauma that a person has experienced, and feel that, and react to that, 
Oh, it has like one of the worst fucking endings of like I mean yeah, like it's, it's morally it reprehensible. It's trying to be <laughs> ambiguous, I think, in some ways, but it's like, what are we really saying here? Yeah. It's like this is like what the fuck psychopath like wrote this fucking movie. <laughs> it, it, no, I agree. It really it feels like I'm like, what what are we trying to say about this? And if if that is what you're trying to say, it doesn't track with a maybe real world experience. It's a very odd movie and then it's very I think high concept in that we're having very intimate re- interactions with aliens. The first interaction is uh, is a is more of a smaller home invasion but that ends with, you know, uh, uh Fights Jesus. and knocking him out, and how it's yeah, a weakness. Yeah, stabbing an and, alien yeah. in the head, yeah. and killing him, which is sort of the device that sets off the rest of the movie. We get bigger aliens appear. Bigger aliens with crab. Now, I, I do like certain aspects, and like the big alien with crab legs coming into the like the bigger aspect of it is just kind of interesting to me because you know. Um, uh, I, I wait for the day when the alien invasion happens and we get big spacecrafts and all that. And so when it happens in real life, it's going to be fascinating to me. That's that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, it, it'll be great. I, I wait for the alien, the real alien invasion. Um, <laughs> I'm weird like that. But the, this movie goes in so many different directions, and the 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 cause for things to happen to the character. And and how she reacts to them, and the reason why she's able to deter these aliens does not make sense to me. Uh, in a way that everyone else critically seems to celebrate and love of this movie, and I think there was a, 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 a there was a wave of this movie where people liked it and um and you know love the character love what happened and everything but i didn't understand because it didn't make sense to me because things didn't happen in what i thought was a natural way as natural as you can get when you're being invaded physically by an alien <laughs> through your mouth and then you have to try and figure out how to pull that out of your system and be a human again yeah it's a um, gimmick movie it's one of those movies where the director or you know sets up yes. a challenge for themselves right and which, it really does come back to the fact that no one's in this movie, which is yeah. not it doesn't work for this movie because people would be speaking at certain parts in this movie there is like a breathless line of dialogue or two in this movie that the main character does speak other than that characters interact with each other like they have uh, they've never spoken the English language before which doesn't make sense for the movie but whatever that's what they're, the, the movie makers are trying to do um, I think it's a lot of uh, uh people trying to do big things that I don't think they execute well. Um, mm-hmm. I think I'm in the minority, uh, apparently by popular opinion. No, I didn't like how it. This was, yeah, I'm not here. No, I think we're, uh, you, you're right, Holly. I think I'm going to be coming here, but I think that but I don't know if that's the minority opinion because, uh, you know, you're saying all these people say this, but, like, who have you talked to who liked it? No, no. Uh, uh, no I Sean think... got into a debate at my Halloween party with someone who liked it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> did I? Uh, yeah. You're right. I think I did. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, but uh, I think, all right, without talking to people specifically because I didn't, uh, honestly, I don't think I wanted to talk about it because I thought it was bad. But I think the overall critical opinion was that it was something to pay attention to when I don't think it was. Um, and I think it failed on a few levels, even though I like, you know, I like the actors who were involved and everything, and I like aliens, but I don't think they they tried to achieve something. I don't think they got there. And I think people were fooled for some reason in the make, in the watching of the movie. Um, yeah, so no one will save you. I think is uh, I think a failure of 2023. Um, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I don't uh, see why it was so accepted. Uh, there are certain people I know who thought this was the ultimate movie made for them. I'll leave their names out of it, but they're usually wrong. Um, so I'm not surprised <laughs> that they love this movie, but I've seen a few people who absolutely loved it for what it did, and I think they're completely wrong, and I don't think this was as good as the maybe popular majority, even if that populace was only excited for it for like a month or two. 
I think they were wrong for that month or two before it faded out of existence, and I hope it just fades out of existence forever. So nothing will save you. Uh, goodbye. My most disappointing. Uh, goodbye. Um, what did you think? Yeah, um, you know, like I said earlier, there's a lot of just blah movies this year. I, Sean, I agree with you. I did not enjoy that movie um, at all. Yes. Uh, I watched a lot that I was like, I was looking forward to, and it just didn't do it for me. I, just recently, I watched Bo is Afraid. I didn't like it. I watched Pillars of Flower Moon. I didn't like it. I watched uh, The Killer. I didn't like it. Like, there was just so many movies. Um, oh, Dream, uh, Dream Scenario? Hated it. Did you hate Dreams and I did! I hated it! Alright, that is what, for people who like the Litter Day Nicolas Cage and um, uh, the, um, the massive weight of talent and whatever he did last year and everything. Okay, I love that movie. I like that movie. Right. That, okay. was my number, that was my number one last year, wasn't it? I think yeah. you know. Right, so, like, you wow, Dreams and Arrow, not good? Oh. Yeah, no, I like, he was great in that. I like Nick Cage, and I liked that it was something, I liked that it was original content, it was creative, yes, yes. but it was just, like, the story itself. By the end of I, the have movie, a, yeah. I have a question, Holly, because yeah. can, you, can you confirm or deny that it kind of has a cancel culture-like theme to it? Yes. That's, yeah, that, I heard that, and it turned me off of it so hard. It does very much have a cancel culture theme to it, and it's very much like, this dude is a victim for no reason. And that fucking sucks. Like, the end of the movie, I'm just like, why the fuck did I watch this depressing as hell movie? Is there and, anything um, you can get from the movie that you can't get from the trailer? I know it doesn't explicitly go no. into some plot points, but okay. you see them, and you're no, like, like you, okay, the I know trailer, where this you, is going. You get it. Yeah, yeah okay. okay. It's like yeah, I got the whole movie it's, from it's the trailer. Right. I didn't yes, need to you see do, the movie. You did. Right. You can see where characters were turned yep. based on the trailer. Yeah. Right. And, and like I said, like the concept, like the creativity, I was like, I'm into this. I'm interested. Right. I like it. And just the story, it just doesn't go where you want it to go. It's but that's not, not your worst movie. It's not. Oh, okay. I thought I was about to write it down. So that wasn't it, though. Because as much as I didn't like that, much as I was disappointed in that movie, there was another movie that was just pure trash. And I have a feeling that Kayla might agree with me on this. It is May, December. I'm sorry I did this to you, Holly. This is my fault. I I, 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 I followed this movie on to Holly. Like, I, I texted her. I was like, you heard about this? And then we were like, no. And okay. it's like, oh, there's probably a reason we haven't heard about it, because it sucks ass. All right. So all I know about this movie is that mm -hmm. Anne Hathaway. Yep. No. Yeah. Not no, even no, 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 no. Natalie Portman. Natalie, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was like, yeah, no, it's not. It's no, not Natalie Portman. I'm sorry. Natalie Portman and <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Julianne Moore. Uh, Julianne Moore. Mm -hmm. And that all I know, I, I think, is that uh, Natalie Portman is trying to portray Julianne Moore so she, <laughs> so she follows her life. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, uh, Julianne Moore is Mary Kay Letourneau. Oh, so she's the high school yeah. teacher that yes. married her yes. uh, student. I'm, yes. Oh. oh. Yeah. yeah. That's oh. and yeah. All so right. this movie Take has that. some real unpleasant thoughts on um. Wow. Bad things it, happening to children. Yeah. It's really, really icky, like super <laughs> icky. And I think what makes it even worse is the fact that this movie is getting like rave reviews and it's been nominated for awards. People love it. And People love this that. movie. So the reason why, like, I got attracted to it and recommended it to Holly, we both kind of like parallel watched it at home. It yeah. was like, uh, uh. uh Everyone kept saying it was campy and weird and fun, and none of that. I was expecting like a simple favor type movie, and that's yeah. not what this is. This is like a serious drama, of, like about weird fucking people doing fucked up yeah. stuff. We thought it was going to be like a list actors doing a lifetime movie, like that's yeah, what we thought yeah. it was going to be. Right, and we're like, we're here for it, and no, it's really gross. It's just weird. Like the char every character is bizarre, mm -hmm. and. I mean, I mean, I mean, we all lived through the story. We know the story of Mary Kay Paterno. We know what happened, and so like none of the content is surprising, but just like the analysis of it and the interpretation of it, it's really weird and gross and icky. Yeah. Now, do you think they're trying to, um, whether it's right or not, have an interpretation from what the characters were thinking at the time or what the real people were thinking at the time? Again, not being not being legitimate or right, but being gross. Like, do you think they're trying to play up that aspect of it? That it was wrong? No. 
No. Are they trying to no. normalize May December romance? They're trying to say how weird it like look at this thing to gawk at. Okay. Yeah, that that's they're not like really making a judgment one way or another. They're just they're trying like, to look at it yeah. from all sides. They're like, look at these bizarre creatures in their cages. Like, it's yeah, really weird. It's it's not trying to argue a point. It's trying to be uh, like, wow, is it wasn't that fucking weird? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's yeah. like here's some fucked up people. Everyone's fucked yeah. up. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I. Uh, yeah, that, that's the thing. Is going into it, like Michaela saying, I watched the trailer and I saw that people were saying it was like fun and campy and stuff. And I was all for a lifetime movie with A-list actors. I thought that'd be great. And then watching it, I I cannot believe that this movie is getting rave reviews and being nominated for shit. That boggles my goddamn mind. And I think that's. I mean, not, yeah, that's not the only thing that puts me off. What puts me off is that I spent, like, two hours watching this piece of shit movie. But... Yeah, it's, it's just, long. It's long, and it's, like, it's long and boring and gross. Yeah. It's boring and gross. So that's... I don't know how that works, but it works. Like, the, yeah. <laughs> Boring and gross. Yeah. And, I and, and that it's, movie. A, it's a Netflix movie. They're on my shit list this year, man. They have put out some garbage. See, that's the thing, though, because two of my favorites were Netflix movies. Oh, so man. I was like, they're doing okay in some areas, <laughs> but that <laughs> one was just a Netflix total shit show. Give you the spectrum of garbage. You oh, it was such a life. shit show. So, yeah, I, hands down, my least favorite was May December. Gross. <laughs> And I had a lot of disappointing movies this year. <laughs> it was hard for me to pick favorite ones. <laughs> anyway, who's next? Michaela's next. Yep. Yes. Um. Okay. Yeah. May this De- like I would May December. I'm not. I, I knew you were gonna pick it, so I was like, I'll just jump in on that. But yeah, I would. I would advise you to stay away from May December. I would advise you to stay away from 65. Um. Oh, and 60, yeah. You watched yeah. the So what Oof. did you not like about 65? Well, I was gonna. I would. I was gonna make That's that my worst. Being but in, uh, it's, Fast and Furious movie. It's, it's not at all. I wish it was a fucking Fast and Furious movie. It's nothing like that. It's boring. It's dull. Oh, yeah. The, the, the numbers of mentions of family were insane. But um, it, it's bad. for it was, it was my most offensive until I watched another Netflix movie, Leave the World Behind. <laughs> Fuck right. this movie. Right, Fuck so this what, movie. What, what is the premise of this movie? Okay. So this movie is directed and written by Sam Esmail, who created Mr. Robot and has done a lot of TV like that. Um, so the premise is it is present day ish. Um, and Julia Roberts and her husband, Ethan Hawke, are just tired of life. So they're going to go on vacation to a remote cabin. But the remote cabin, like, it's like a high tech, really fancy, nice house. It's not like an isolated cabin. Um, and uh, while they're there, uh, it's like a Hamptons house. It is like a Hamptons house, yeah. Actually, they might be in the Hamptons. I think it is. I think yeah. it's a Hamptons house. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, the internet goes out, satellites go out, and uh, no one knows why. And everyone starts to not trust each other. And, um, you know, stop if you've heard this before, but, you know, people might have ulterior motives and bigger things might be happening. And everyone's talking about this. And then the movie just ends. And that, it was the, one of the most frustrating watches I've had in a long time. <laughs> the um, sequel. You got to leave the door open for the franchise. Uh, one of the most baffling things about this movie uh, is in the beginning, there's like a le- real deal title sequence. And it said produced by Barack and Michelle Obama. Well, I heard they had like okay. a Netflix deal, but yeah. I didn't know they were yeah. going to get yeah. into fiction. Stuff, but, but here's the thing that makes that extra weird is that. The things happening in this movie are mostly government conspiracies. Like yeah. it's a government, and it's a government conspiracy that takes out the internet, and then they get flyers dropped, and then a boat crashes. It's like all these different kind of disasters are happening at once, and it's all part of some plan to take down America. But that's all the information you really get, and it's just weird that this is the movie they chose to back. Like, what are they trying to say with this? You know. Um, <laughs> But, oh my god, it is just, it is aggressively, um, Sean and Colin, you'll appreciate this, this movie is aggressively pro-physical media. There is a lot. It's, it's, uh, like, even the end button of the movie is like, 
a point about physical media. Like, yeah. ironic because you'll never be able to own it on physical it, media. Exactly, because it's Netflix. It doesn't make right. any sense. Yeah, this movie is just really, really cynical, and it's trying to be like a puzzle box, like Black Mirror, or like <laughs> yeah, I even got like Lost vibes from it a little bit, but. The one of the of one of the one of the catalysts of this movie is there is a little girl that even though it's the end of the world or whatever, she's constantly trying to watch the last episode of Friends. Yes, <laughs> that's a running thing in this movie. Um, it, it's wow. Yeah, yeah, it, that's a running thing in that movie. But it's <laughs> this movie is just really cynical, and it. Yeah. But it just and Julia Roberts was especially bad. Like wow, she, it feels like she's been out of the game for a while because it was it was rough. Um, her just, character is bad though. Like I don't even yeah. know so much her. It's just her character is bad. Yeah, because like there's that weird cold open where she looks like directly into camera and is like, I fucking hate people, and then it cuts yeah. to the title. Okay. It was really okay. weird. Now I know this is weird, and I know we've been talking about a, a lot of movies that we shouldn't see. Every mention you guys have of this movie that makes it bad, I just want to watch it more. It's yeah, boring, I, I, though. It's so no, here's boring. what I was going to say. I just watched this movie, and I didn't hate it. <laughs> I, oh, I, I didn't hate it. I, I didn't hate it. No, I want to watch this movie just to, because, like, I want to, if nothing else, either I want to watch it and be like, you're wrong, which I, uh, that's not my purpose to, to try and prove you guys wrong. But I also want to watch it and be like, oh, you're fucking right. This was just a... Yeah, I'm just saying, like, don't say I didn't warn you, you know? Yeah, like, no, no, no. But, but, but at least I can be... But thank you, because at least I can be prepared for it going into it. But here's the thing, like, so pu- what makes puzzles satisfying and, like, <laughs> puzzle box shows and TVs and movies work is that you're getting all these pieces, but it's leading to a solid, direct conclusion. Sure. Like... It is leading to some something, so it makes all that effort worth it. And you can't just give me all the puzzle pieces and slowly start laying them and then leave the middle part completely blank and then just end and throw the puzzle up in the fucking air. You can't yeah. do that, and that's what the movie does. I will agree. Like, I didn't hate the movie. It was parts of it I, I was okay with, but no, the ending is insulting. <laughs> and your virtual alley yeah. is like doing too much because I don't yeah. understand what this character's yeah, yeah, motivation yeah. is. And then I love yeah. him, and this movie made me kind of think twice about loving him and i'd hate yeah. that so uh yeah a hard pass on leave leave this movie behind it it fucking sucks <laughs> <laughs> wow well that's uh i guess that's it right i mean that's the year yeah, in review we got five yeah. five well i guess it's a uh, 20 2023 was a rough year for movies yeah, yeah. Think, yeah rough yeah <laughs> yeah, but we have twenty twenty four to look forward to. What so will happen? Six. Let's just no, <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Well, I mean, they were out of work for so long this year, so I imagine there can't be a whole lot in the pipeline. And no, right. I don't it's know. Gonna be bad next True. year. True. I yeah. just my hope is that um, yeah, uh, it's just it's this perpetual battle between like streaming and Marvel, two enemies of the movie business. I think mm-hmm. that you know, streaming has to figure out a way to make movies special. Uh, things that you would go to actually see in a theater because I think that's the upside you know know, we talk about like Barbenheimer and all that but I mean it was the significance of that was that like this movie Oppenheimer made like a colossal amount of money and it's a historical drama that's like three hours long that you know people saw it some of them anyway saw it as like this dare because it was like you know (laughs) they came out on the same week and like counter programming it's like well we're we're gonna go see them both you know (laughs) um but the idea that it's like an adult drama that like uh, you know uh, many people saw is some kind of like achievement it shows that there are um there is an audience for movies that aren't you know all bubblegum popcorn aimed at 13 year old kids you know yes that we will go see adult movies and and then it kind of reached the level of excitement in that in like oh we recognize this recognize this as a big adult movie but we are all very excited for it but do but you have to recognize that as an opposition or as a, uh, as a second half to Barbie, because I don't think Oppenheimer would have been. It would have been a big Christopher Nolan movie. I agree, but not but, that big. But not yeah. that big. Not when you have 
Barbie coming out with it. I think yeah. it's like we have we do have to recognize that that is the oh I think Barbie uh, like far out grossed it, but makes it yeah. Well, not even that. Just 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 because the just uh, of the look, the the opposing uh, material and everything. Like I, Oppenheimer would not have been as huge if not for Barbie. Same. I think same for I think Barbie may have been. As Barbie would have, Barbie would have been huge either way. Yeah, it would have been Barbie huge either way. Right. Barbie would have been huge either way. I and Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer with Christopher Nolan Oppenheimer would have been big, but I mean, yeah, because Barbie came out. Barbie yeah, but I mean, so I awesome. just you know, I guess you know the fact. I think Maestro had an opportunity to probably be in the same league, but we're never yeah. going to know. We're never going to know if anybody actually right. saw it. You know, I mean. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just like the fact that like I didn't know it was out, you know. Right. I had it's heard tough. it's tough it's tough to be definitive with movies nowadays. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. because the, it's not the, it's, the, it's not special. I Oppenheimer, Barbie were special. You know what I right. mean? Mm-hmm. There was a cultural thing that made yes. them special where Maestro is not special. It's just the part of the weekly dump on netflix you know right. like the mm-hmm. 10 things that they have or the 20 of the 100 i don't even know they just right. dump it, shit it, on there no, my story is part of the holiday the holiday uh, uh oscar bait dump it, it feels like maybe it may yeah. be more but and they do this all the time because there's plenty of good movies that have come through you know netflix i mean even the fact that uh you right. know david fincher basically works it because i thought mank was uh-huh. one that probably um was that two years ago <laughs> one year ago two years ago probably would have done better if like it actually went to theaters and had promotion behind it but oh, right yeah yeah <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. One of my one of my um honor well honorable mention. It's an honorable mention series. Was Jury Duty was a really fun show. <laughs> right, I saw the yeah. trailers for the yeah, yeah, exactly, It's yeah. really fun. I'm aware that that's well, out yeah, there. Love so that. Yeah. 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 I'll have to look up Reptile because that sounds up my alley. Yeah. I've never heard of it. You know. Reptile great. So. I'll see if I can add that to my uh, watch that before the the year ends and uh, uh, what two days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of which, so uh, next week, uh, and thank you for uh, joining us on the supersized episode. Thank you for suffering mm-hmm. through the audio issues. We're, we, we were sorry for COVID. Uh, we didn't, we didn't, we we didn't so make it. We're sorry for COVID. But we're sorry. Um, so, so we caused COVID. I'm so sorry. So what <laughs> we're doing next people, week. When you cause COVID. <laughs> well, next no, week we're him. somebody ate a part of him and just like I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, next <laughs> week we are returning to watching movies here on Saturday Night Free Show. But guess what? We're going to watch movies that you have chosen, that you have Yay! voted on. Thank yes. you all for submitting. Seriously, we really appreciate it. We, had, we like, very much appreciate it. We are starting the new year off with you. I mean, that's yeah. the best you can get from a podcast. We start with we start with you and what you want to start the year. Give the yeah. people what they want. Oh yeah, we exactly. should we should mention. Uh, I know it was all messed up in the voting this year, but it was intentional. It's like if you can submit four uh, four movies, then you can only vote for three, you can right? Vote for three. And it keeps. <laughs> but I think the wording was wrong, and once the poll started, I couldn't change it. I'm like, oh crap! It says you know vote for. So yeah, you were limited to only three titles, so you couldn't right. vote we for will, your four. We'll watch the top four. Yeah, we will watch the top four. We're starting with that uh, next week. Oh, by the way, it occurred to me, uh, Exorcism movie, without Exorcism, the title, all the Conjuring movies. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, we're not watching Conjuring movies next week. They weren't even on the <laughs> list. Uh, but unfortunately, as of tonight, we cannot tell you what next week's movie is going to be. That's still be. Stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned. The suspense builds. So right. we, we hope <laughs> you you'll join us. find out. Join us in 2024 for new and exciting things on the Saturday Night Freak Show. Uh, thank you for listening to us in 2023. And we appreciate Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right. And now the basement is going dark.